Hi there, guys. This is Dan Dix here reporting for Press for Truth with breaking news. I just got out of the B.C. Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, for the final decision in a case that I've been following for almost five years now. And viewers of this channel are probably already well aware of the B.C. father whose daughter, when she was in grade seven, was shown a video by her teachers featuring a transgender character. And she started thinking, I, I also want to cut my hair short. I, I also want to identify as a boy, just like the character in that video. The teachers entertained this. They allowed her to change her name. They allowed her to change her pronouns. They suggested she go get some counseling. And the counselor suggested she go talk to a doctor. The doctor suggested she starts transitioning. All of this happened unbeknownst to this father. So mm -hmm. obviously he's royally upset the courts ended up saying he's not allowed to misgender his daughter he's not allowed to uh use the incorrect pronouns he can't use her so-called dead name a little bit of the I'll, we'll get talk about this in thorough detail at another point in time and hopefully dan dix is going to come on the channel and hopefully the guy at issue here there was also a divorce going on in this where the mother from what i understand was you know playing favorites with the kid and all sorts of other dynamic we'll we'll, we'll, we'll play this out here and he's not allowed to talk to the press about any of this. A so-called gag order was placed on this. Now, obviously, with this being insanely tyrannical, he uh, didn't didn't do any of these things. Ended up spending 69 days in jail for that, and he was also facing a fine of upwards of thirty thousand dollars. Unless I'm mistaken, those are the contempt fines. He was jailed for contempt for violating a court order, not to identify the doctor, not to identify his his kid by name. The misgendering was sort of incidental, tangentially related, but nonetheless, in one of the court orders, the judge said misgendering your kid could be tantamount to child abuse. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, the judge just decided that he has won his case. He won his appeal. I, I think it's only the appeal on the contempt conviction, not the merits of the case to be determined. But this is enough of an overview is what we need right now. No more fines, no more jail time. Uh, that's it. That, that's the end of it. This is such good news. This is a huge step in the right direction for justice and sanity. And it just goes to show when you stand up like this man did, against the trans activists who are taking up the BC courts and the lawyers and the judges, we can have a victory. I'll cut it there because the victory comes after a man was put in jail for however many days uh, on, not on the original issue. It's always on contempt. If they don't get you on the initial accusations, they'll get you in the process. You know, with half of these charges against politicians or the, the you know, they're, 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 friends or allies, if I'm thinking Trump, they don't get you on the substance of the claims. They get you on the process. They get you for lying to FBI during an investigation. They got this guy in jail for 60 some odd days on contempt. This is going to be a theme for today's stream with Arthur Pavlovsky. Here's a link to Dan Dix's tweet. And by the way, that's a, a, a timely opening video because I was just listening to Alyssa Milano. I, I forget what show it was in. Beverly Hills 90210? It was Beverly Hills 90210. I was listening to her interview the mother of a trans kid. Um, I, I should not have listened to that before doing this interview because I'm distracted and I'm enraged, but it fits well with the opening video. So from that to where we're going now, jailed on contempt, secret trials, gag orders, political prisoners. I have been waiting to interview Arthur Pavlovsky since the first video went viral, the get out, get out minutes. Does everybody remember this video? Get out. And it's become something, I, I, Archer doesn't know this, but he's going to find out right now, something of a, of a known term in our house immediately. Because like, Arthur Pavlovsky has an Eastern European Polish accent. And when he told the Alberta Health Services to get out immediately, and whenever I say that to my kids, immediately with the accent, they know it's gotten serious. Uh, I've been waiting to interview Arthur since the beginning, and his story has taken many a turn. If you don't know who Arthur Pavlovsky is, he is the get out, get out minister. Uh, told Alberta Health Services to get out when they tried to shut down. I think it was Easter services, but we'll get some details on that. Um, let me make sure. Are we not? Oh, we're not on the local stream. Son of a gun. Thank you very much. Hold on. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. People, I'm, I'm such an idiot. Arthur, give me two seconds. I just have to add the local stream to this because ich bin ein idiot. Hold on here. Add the RTPM. That's, oops, hold on a second. This should be up there in 30 seconds, people. Sorry about that. 
and this and we'll do locals so we get this on youtube for now locals rumble save and then refresh and it should be there in a few seconds hold on let me know everybody it should be live right now okay are we live i've just added it live now good okay forgot to add the rtpm so we got arthur Pablowski here and we're starting from childhood people but arthur you ready i'm bringing you in three two one now before i bring us in i want to see what's in the backdrop you've got um i have to bring us in there you got solidarity on the on your uh that's your left correct no that's your right you got solidarity on the right we're gonna bring you in here arthur okay first of all thank you very much for coming on i've been waiting for this for a long time i've got more questions than i can count uh, for those who may not know who you are, just give us the 30,000 foot overview and then we're going to get into everything. Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for what you're doing. I mean, I remember when I watched your uh, video about what happened to me uh, and the way you did it, um, the genuine, um, you know, anger that I saw in you and people like you covering the story, what is going on in our beloved Canada, that gave me courage, that gave me hope that I'm not alone. And I think that's one of the most important things to know that we have others just like us, that we're not alone, that we're not crazy. The whole world can go crazy, but at least there are some that are sane. So I grew up, as you can tell, behind the Iron Curtain under the boots of the Soviets in a very peculiar country, Poland. Why Poland is so important? Uh, because it was the nation that was attacked uh, by the Nazis. So I grew up hearing the stories from my grandparents, from the older generation about the rape, pillaging, murder, concentration camps. Of course, I grew up in a city that had a concentration camp, a Nazi concentration camp. As kids, we were playing in the bunkers of the SS. I visited Auschwitz-Birkenau many times. I took Canadian and American friends. There. I took my family multiple times there. Why? Because we have to remember what happens when you do not put a check in some of those people's powers. And that's exactly what we're witnessing right now. We've lost accountability. We've lost checks and balances. They can do whatever they want. And literally, they are escaping getting away with the murder. So I saw the atrocities of the communism and socialism. And people ask me how it was. Uh, well, one word comes to mind, hell. Communism and socialism is hell. 50,000 communists were ruling over 36 million Polish people with the iron fist. If you disagreed with the party line, and I'm telling you, there were multiple parties, in quote, just like we have multiple parties in Canada, but they were all chirping the same party line, just like we have right now. The same thing. They were heading towards the same cliff and dragging us with them. 50,000 people ruling 36 million Poles, treating them as slaves. My childhood was a constant lineup, standing for bread. Uh, you couldn't see the end of the lineups. You couldn't just go to the store and buy. You know, imagine when I share my story with the Canadian minds or Americans, they look at me like I'm crazy. Imagine going to your Safeway, Walmart, Costco, and the only thing you see is vinegar, like thousands, tens of thousands of bottles of vinegar. Uh, how how can you explain that? P people cannot even imagine. Uh, imagine a child that gets a chocolate once a year. Imagine me growing up as a kid and my mom would bring a chocolate for Christmas. And if a miracle actually happened and it had peanuts in it, I would break those little boxes and I would leak the chocolate around the peanut and I would leave it, save it for the next day. So it can last longer. Um, for years, we could we did not see oranges or bananas. It depends of the season. Sometimes uh, the shipment would come and we would have a little bit more. And sometimes was empty shelves. So that's the childhood. That's uh, that's a horror movie uh, when we are talking about communism and socialism. So finally, also I believe why they hate me so much, why they attack me so much, because I also witnessed with my own eyes Solidarity Movement in Poland. And I don't know uh, how much you're familiar with Solidarity, like Wałęsa, Polish uprising, uh, the civil rights movement in Poland in 1980. Uh, but here is what happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, millions of people said, finally, enough is enough. And they took it to the streets. They refused to cooperate. They refused to work. Non-compliance. Simply say no. 
and they did that uh, by the millions and it cracked it, you know it destroyed uh, the wannabe pharaohs yes it took a few years uh, the first year we had uh, 1 million members the government outlawed solidarity in 81 a martial law came just like this trudeau castro caligula of today uh, did to us and then it grew to 3 million People fought, tens of thousands were arrested, and I'm not talking about fighting with guns and swords. Everything was peacefully. Uh, the only violence was always coming from the communists and socialists. And then eventually, in 1989, uh, Poland was liberated, Berlin Wall collapsed, Iron uh, Curtain was broken. Poland had its first, after the invasion of the Germans in 1939, first free and democratic election. So that's what I saw with my own eyes. Horror movie hell and then liberty my parents decided uh, that it's enough and they took us to greece and then from greece we had a meeting with the canadian embassy and i will never forget the meeting the officer said come to canada sell everything you have we had businesses in greece um and canada is the freest country on earth come and in canada no one will ever persecute you for your fate and that's 340 citations later 16 arrests many times i was detained 120 court cases later so i was a businessman that's what i did for a level uh, living i was a very successful businessman i had houses properties i was a land developer i was a builder that's what i did in greece as well uh, with my um, family and uh, finally, something happened with my son. You've met my son, Nathaniel. He was born uh, on my birthday. And his name means gift from God, but he was born dead. He was born with a, a messed up upper chest. The bowels went up, destroyed his upper chest. He was born without a lung. Um, heart was pushed. Doctor said he's not going to live. And I think that was the first time in my life that I started to evaluate what's really important. That's what changed my life. That's what I'm trying to say. That situation that no money could save my son, that no uh, experts, the medical profession, they all throw a towel and they ask us to unplug him. That was my moment with God. What is really important? I'm telling you, I'm sticking now to what's important. Freedom, the liberty, family, children, uh, money, power, titles, properties, all of those things are not as important as some people think uh, they are. You cannot buy happiness. You cannot buy freedom. So fast forward, I decided when God Whoa. healed me, son. Hold on a second. Um, no, okay, we're going to we're, so we're, finish with this. I mean, um, your, your son is born, and do they, they're going to tell you that he doesn't have long to live? Where, how, okay, sorry. Finish that. Yeah, so what happened through a, a muscle a hole in a muscle the bowels went up and messed up his upper chest and the doctors said that there is nothing that they can do they asked us to unplug him he was born dead they revived him back to life put him on the machinery and, and a respirator the whole nine yards and then they came with a conclusion uh, there is nothing we can do uh, so that was the moment that uh, you know, my life started to change because I started to realize what's really important and what's not. Fast forward, it takes me an hour and a half to tell the story. Um, but hour and a half later, he was healed. And that was a miracle. Uh, that's according to the doctors. I got three books on, on the story from the hospital. Uh, they said we cannot explain what happened. Within a few hours, the heart moved to its natural place. The lung that was not there appeared and my son was completely healed i mean you've met him uh you you interviewed him he just finished university and he's fighting like a lion uh, that he is right now against the corrupted establishment so um but that incident those few weeks of fighting for his life and not knowing what is going to happen it changed my life and i decided to work with the homeless people and that what got me in trouble believe it or not not anything else that i was doing in life but feeding the poor in 2005 i was doing this already for six years however my ministry grew to seven locations we had 250 volunteers and we took 600 people off the streets and it was then when we became so successful that politicians mainstream media um the whole nine yards police bylaw uh came and announced that, by the way, in Canada, you're not allowed to feed the poor anymore. 
there are laws against that giving free goods and services. If you pray, Mr. Palaski, for a homeless person, you're breaching the bylaw. You're not allowed to give free services to those people without a special permit. You're not allowed to congregate. You're not allowed to have offensive signs. Um, I got $10,000 tickets for Jesus loves you, Jesus is king signs um, end up in court. Uh, during that time, uh, about 100 court cases, 11 arrests, and about 300 citations. I received also tickets for distributing printed material. Uh, believe it or not, all of those things are in the books. Those are actual laws. Now, this is crazy stuff. This we're going to get to in a bit because this is a separate. Uh, I talked about it with Nathaniel as to what the rationale is, why politicians might have been angry at your at your at your church or your ability to do better for the homeless people. What the government was. Now we got to back it up all the way back to literally World War II, Arthur. First of all, if I may ask, I, I think I know how old you. How old are you? Fifty. Fifty years old. So you're born in seventy three. Seventy three. Uh, you, your parents are they still alive? Yes, they're in Calgary, Alberta. And how old were your parents during World War II? Well, my parents, my father was born in the 50, uh, 1950, my mom 55. My grandparents lived through the entire Second World War. And how did you did you have the benefit of growing up with your grandparents? Did they live a, a long life? Yes. You know, and this is the interesting thing like you know, everybody knows that I'm my grandparents were my, well my grandfather was actually from Poland as well. But on the Jewish side, he left in 1936. The Poles or the Polish get a, a bit of a, uh, I say a bad rap and I'll be accused of all sorts of names for this in that from the Jewish perspective and the Jewish history, we say the Nazis were bad to the Jews as were the Poles after the Nazis invaded. Historically, I think there's a lot of people who overlook or don't fully appreciate the treatment that the Poles got from the Nazis, which I think you need to flesh out. We all know that, you know, uh, Germany invaded Poland in 1939. That's sort of what, 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 started the war maybe it started before but that's sort of like the, the determining starting point can you tell you tell us tell the world what your grandparents were laid to you life was like under nazi occupation well it was it was unbelievable i mean when you watch the movies it was a lot worse than that my grandma was telling me stories uh, where uh, the nazi ss were raping girls on top of her when she was hiding uh, under the mattress um, when they were going from house to house, uh, stealing and uh, raping. Uh, my um, uh, grandparents from my uh, father's side, the same thing, uh, you know, seeing the atrocities of the of, of the Nazis is unbelievable. I mean, uh, they were uh, taking uh, children, uh, throwing them on the walls, like literally taking little babies and throwing them in front of the parents on the walls. I mean, uh, lots of older people, don't, didn't want to even talk about what they saw because it, it was breaking them. My grandma was in Auschwitz. They took her two babies. And um, Dr. Mengele, the famous Mengele, uh, did experiments on them. She never saw uh, the babies again. Uh, also, they were doing experiments on her with, um, with those little uh, creatures that eat your flesh. Uh, they would uh, lock her leg under um, a something, a device, and those things were just eating her alive without, of course, any painkillers. So they lived through that. And uh, when 1945 came, it was no better because then we were taken over by vicious Russians. You got to remember, 11 million Polish people were murdered by the Nazis from 1939 to 45. We talk a lot about what happened to the Jewish people, of course, but 11 million Poles were slaughtered, murdered without mercy. Auschwitz-Birkenau, people do not know, but Auschwitz-Birkenau started with the Poles, uh, not with the Jewish people. Then they enlarged the territory, if you will, and they started to bring uh, Jewish people from all over the world. So what I'm trying to say is the first victims of the Nazi regime were the Germans. Uh, you got to remember, hundreds of thousands of Germans were murdered before Adolf Hitler invaded Poland. Totalitarian regime, dictatorships, uh, they have, uh, they don't care about human lives, either their own people or neighbors. Uh, they are caring about keeping their power with the iron fist. So um, for 
250,000 disabled German people were killed in the 30s. Uh, hundreds of thousands of babies when uh, Adolf Hitler declared that only pure uh, blood is allowed. So if you think, if you suspect that uh, the guy that you, uh, you know, impregnated you uh, is, is not of pure German blood, then you get a murder your child. So this genocide, you got to remember, people don't know that the first um, a chamber to kill people with gas the first gas chamber was not in the concentration camps it was in the in the hospitals the first murderers for the nazi party were not the gestapo you know as as crazy people were the doctors and the nurses people just don't know the history but being a paul growing up in a in a country like this i mean history was everywhere wherever you turn there was some history so we learned about it we we knew what was going on in the third, you know, late 30s and, and 45 until 45. And then, of course, I saw with my own eyes what happened under communism and, and socialism. I left the country when I was 17. So I was a young man. But I mean, for 17 years, I was subjected to this craziness and, and, and we had to live through it. I mean, that was just everyday's life. You could be arrested for anything. Police officers, they had their famous saying, give us a man and we'll find something on that man. Uh, I remember the whispers. I remember how neighbors were afraid of each other because you never know if he is a spy or maybe they blackmailing him or maybe they arrested his wife or his kid. Uh, in order for him or her to get uh, some insights. It, it was a horror movie. I'm, you know, people do not understand that exactly what we witnessed in the past three years, that's how the totalitarian regime, either the Nazi or the communism, was unfolding. It starts identical way. That's why when I said to those people, you know, Nazis, Gestapo, psychopaths, come, I, you know, I knew what I was talking about because that's exactly how it started. It uh, doesn't start with people being shot in the head in the middle of the streets. It doesn't start that way. It starts with, you know, people rotting on each other. It starts with them invading your uh, your private place, places. They It starts with them telling you what you can and cannot talk about. Uh, them telling you what's acceptable, what's not. Like this man that you started your show with, the DC, uh, that could not call his daughter daughter i mean this is insanity that's how nazism that's how communism socialism that's how the totalitarian regime gets a foothold and then it's over and so the war ends i mean this is an amazing thing that people also sometimes don't even think about the war ends and it's it's not people have to go back to living next to countries that were they were not just oppressors, were their murderers. But now you're under communist regime, so you go from fascism to communism, uh, from the from the fire to the to the boiling pot, or whatever the expression is. Are your are your grandparents broken as humans going forward? Do you notice this? Uh, do they bring you up and do they tell you about this? Do they warn you about this? Or are you under living under communism? You're still not even at liberty to discuss what just happened to the prior generation. I uh, know it was fascinating because um, when I was a kid, um, we were always indoctrinated. That's why I see indoctrination in this country, left and right, because we were subjected to indoctrination every day. I remember when they were teaching us the, the Germans are bad, uh, awful, uh, but the Russians are the saviors of the world. And I remember when the teachers were forcing us to say Diedushka Stalin, which means Grandpa Stalin. Uh, we were told that he is the savior that Stalin is the best man ever lived and you are to worship him, that you are to worship communism and socialism. But the Germans were always the bad ones. So there was no problem to always vilify the Nazis, to vilify the Germans, as long as you were not talking about the Soviets. And of course, we know that more people were murdered by the Soviets than by the Germans. Uh, we were talking about 60 million to, in comparison to 40 or, or so. Um, so my gra uh, grandparents freely were talking about what the Nazis did. However, privately, they were telling us what the Soviets did in 1945. So when the whole world was celebrating liberation, of the whole world from the Nazi regime, we were subdued, taken hostage, um, enslaved uh, by the Soviets. And if you were caught with a pamphlet that was not approved by the Soviet, uh, by the Communist Party, uh, you could be tortured. And torture was a normal thing. 
uh, of course, political dissidents would end up not just in jail, but in mental institution like they did it to me. Uh, they, you would be locked in some psych ward, um, you know, and, and no one would ever hear from you again, or you will be sent to go like my grandfather was sent to Siberia. Um, and he uh, took him a year to come to Poland. My grandma escaped um, an arrest by the Soviets in Romania with my great uncle. And my great uncle was a soldier and he lowered her uh, with the ropes and they escaped to Poland. So my family is a family that has fought not just the Nazis, but also the Soviets, the communists. All our history is a history of resistance and fighting uh, with those uh, wannabe pharaohs of today. So you could talk and you heard from the older generation all the time about the Nazis, what they did. But privately, when they knew no one is watching or listening, they would tell you what the Soviets did and what the Soviets were still doing. And of course, as a kid, I could see things. I could see the fear. Um, if you were listening, I remember the neighbors were listening to a uh, European radio and, and it was hush hush. No one could know because if you are caught just listening to a European radio, it doesn't matter what the European radio was saying. If you were caught just listening to that five years and then, of course, torture and inhumane uh, treatment. So that's what I see right now unfolding in front of our very eyes. And the grandparents were very vocal and they were broken people. They loved us. They did the best for us. But you could tell, you could tell that the violence that they received sometimes was coming out. Um, you could tell that the generation that witnessed that, I'm talking about the generation that went through the Second War, was a generation of broken people. They've seen the most horrible things. They went through the most horrible experiences, and you could tell it was still hurting them. Uh, they've lost loved ones. My, um, my wife's uh, grandparents wiped out by the Germans, just boom, like that. Uh, the grandma had to grow up uh, by herself. Uh, and, and after the Second War, I'm telling you, it was not just hell on earth, but uh, the necessities of life were not there. You were truly living like in a jungle of violence and fighting to survive for, no, for another day. My father, uh, he was born in 1950. Uh, quite often, even uh, last week, uh, he told me, so listen, he is almost 70. Oh, no, he is over 70 now. Um, and, and he still remembers, and he comes out from time to time. After all those many years, you know, he said as a kid, uh, we didn't have chocolates. We didn't have any sweets. Our sweet was a, a bread, a just piece of bread, water on top, and a little bit of sugar. That was their treat. And barefoot, running barefoot. We're talking about, uh, a, a, you know, a middle of Europe. We're talking about Poland. You know, and they were running barefoot. I remember when I was growing up, entire block. So I don't know, 5,000 people, 10,000 people. Only one kid in an entire neighborhood had a soccer ball. Just one. So if that kid couldn't come to play, no one was playing soccer. So think about that. How can you explain to the kids right now what I'm trying to warn you about that this is a disaster. In the end of the day, you got no idea what is going to destroy you. Children, your grandchildren are going to live in hell. What we're going to do now, we're going to move on over to Rumble, everybody, and end this on YouTube because speaking of platforms that don't deserve our presence, this is one of them. We're going to go over to Rumble and it's going to change nothing from our end. We're going to continue this there and I'll publish the whole thing to YouTube tomorrow. Uh, so come on over to Rumble, ending on YouTube in three, two, one now. Okay, so you leave uh, Poland. You go to Greece sev at 17 years of age. Um, you're born in 73. The The wall comes down in 89. Yes. Uh, so you're, did you, you, I'm sorry. So hold on. You came down, you you left to Greece after the wall came down. What's yeah. No, so, so, so what happened was after the wall came down, and that's a story that not many people know, um, in Russia, Putin took over the government. I, I don't know if you are familiar who Putin is. Putin was the KGB boss. 
and mafia took over um, behind the Iron Curtain, the countries that were subdued by the communism and socialism were taken over by mafia, like literally mafia took over. And um, the government came to Putin and asked him to deal with mafia because it was under control. So what he did, he shot them in the middle of the streets. He shot a few of them in a very spectacular public way, filmed the whole nine yards, and um, he took over mafia. In Poland, was a very similar situation. The institutions were taken because it was chaos, communist collapses. Uh, yes, we have free and democratic election, but uh, no one knows who is good, who is bad. So mafia took over business. I mean, everything. Well, and actually, if I may, because co communism falls, there's no banks. Like, the, there's no basic infrastructure. How, how does the banking gets taken over by the mafia? Like, how, how do basic necessities that people use for their lives, how do they come to be as institutions after the fall of communism? Smuggling. I was a smuggler. And that's a story, you know, that not many people know. When I was growing up behind the Iron Curtain, we started a smuggling business. I mean, smuggling right now, it sounds horrible, but I mean, you couldn't just go and buy things. You had to bring them illegally because, for example, you couldn't just go and buy TV because the TV from behind the Iron Curtain was deemed evil because it was coming from not the communist state. Uh, so what we did, we brought that in. And of course, to do that, you had to deal with some, uh, you know, not good people. Our police were uh, corrupted. I mean, the whole communism and socialism is bribe after bribe after bribe. I remember my parents always had something with them to bribe. You couldn't just go to a hospital. You had to go to a hospital with something and you would give it to the nurse. You would give it to the uh, to the doctor uh schools the same thing you know think about it my driver's license well i studied i finished uh, but you still had to give something uh, to the teacher that just how it was everyone was bribing everyone all the time it, it was insanity so when mafia takes over it was the borders are open and now everybody is flooding the the nations around to bring stuff in because you got to remember for over 30 years you were not allowed to have certain things you were not allowed to to buy stuff from behind the iron curtain so we did that we brought stuff in and and it was growing bigger and bigger black market and then mafia took over all of that it was extremely dangerous it was it was it was also hell on earth and my parents said that's it enough we're we're, we're done with poland we're done we were subjected to communism and socialism for so long. And now this chaos, bribery constantly, violence, uh, police officers were shot, uh, judges were shot. It, it was it was unbelievable. Reporters were shot. And they said, you know what, that's it. That's it. Let's start all over. And they decided, my father decided to go to Greece in 89. And then uh, my mom and uh, joined him with us. And during that time, we were not allowed to leave the country. We had to escape on a boat. Uh, we stayed in Greece for five years. In 1995, we finally arrived in Canada, Calgary, Alberta. So there is a lot of drama in those countries after the collapse of the Iron Curtain, at the Berlin Wall, because there was nothing and suddenly everyone wanted to have what other people had so imagine the borders now are open and you go to Czechoslovakia or you go to you know other place and you see how other people are living and you say like i want that but you were not allowed to bring it you had to get it bribe the guards and then that's how the business started and it took believe it or not about 10 years finally for the government to crack on mafia uh, to bring some order out of this chaos. Uh, Putin is an interesting story because he just became the mafia. Uh, he took over the prostitution. He took over oil. He took over everything. Uh, I mean, the guy has become mafia. That's why he became the richest man on earth during that time uh, because he took over the bosses and he subdued the ones that he didn't shoot uh, because he, as a KGB, had he had already the army in quote under him right he had the people he had the muscle and when communist collapses i mean that was just the normal thing from a you know a political realm from the government 
to a private and and that's exactly what he did uh they don't don't kid yourself there were no free elections in russia uh with putin i remember the stories where uh, in a village you have a thousand people and two thousand people showed up to vote uh, even the dead are voting for putin how, that's how popular uh, this guy is so there was in russia there was never a free and democratic election it's all rigged just like it, it is rigged here in canada and now of course, we know that it was rigged also in the United States. Well, I was going to say, that I'm, not, I'm not sure where there's... The, 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 the only question is where they look to be more free and democratic. Uh, before we're going to get into coming to Canada, but just the question I have to ask, because I need to know, you go to Greece um, with nothing. I mean, I, I presume with nothing, that you, cash in your pocket, no bank account. What is it like showing up in a foreign land? Uh, and how do you get started starting from scratch in a new country? Hard, extremely hard. We did not speak Greece, Greek. Um, I remember uh, my father, um, you know, I have a younger brother. My brother is uh, five years old, uh, younger than me. Uh, so I'm 17, he's 12. And we are in Greece. Uh, we just escaped craziness in my country. We want to start all over. And now what? While my father, I will never forget the conversation. He takes me for... Um, a talk and he says son um we don't have money because we escaped with pretty much nothing everything that we had or put it this way everything that my parents accumulated during their lifetime went to tickets to buy a tickets on a boat me my brother my younger brother and my, my mom so three tickets cost us their entire life savings right because the government would not let us get out of the country so we had to uh, do it on a boat and the tickets were so crazy expensive so we and i end up in greece with three american dollars that's it nothing more three american dollars believe it or not to this day i have one of those three american dollars one i spend on gambling just the video game you know i was young and stupid uh, so i put a dollar on some kind of a game that i never saw and it was so awesome and the uh, next dollar i spent on uh, kalamaki which is uh, a, a meat on a stick and uh, a piece of bread and then the third one i said uh, with this one i'll start all over again so my father says son you have a choice either you go to school you go back to school here in greece or your your brother goes to school or you go to work and your brother goes to school and if you want to go to school then he has to go to work i mean there was no option obviously a 12 year old kid couldn't go to work i was 17 so the next thing i got was a shovel and i started to work for a stacker crew um and at the first words i learned here is a um <laughs> crazy story so i'm working with those people i have no idea what they're saying they're yelling and screaming at me i have no idea how to work construction i was studying law i was in school um and then i was a businessman i didn't know how the construction uh works so they are yelling and screaming at me trying to show me what to do and i'm doing my best and in the end i am asking them uh, with international language money if they will pay me right money and they were saying some words and i remembered two of them and i wrote them down so my father can translate this for me and the first word was avrio which means tomorrow tomorrow come back right they were trying to communicate with me we need you tomorrow and you will be paid avrio and the next one was gamoto which is a, a curse actually it's um in a loose um, interpretation of that word is like a, a village idiot. Like, and I've heard that probably a thousand times during that day. They were calling me a village idiot in, in a curse language and um, an avrio. So that was my beginning. And I remember I did very quickly uh, what I thought is going to benefit me. I started to learn the language as soon as I could. And I started to hang around with young people. And you know how the kids are, right? You learn so much from your peers. And so that's what I did. Within six months, I was able to speak quite good Greek already that I could communicate and, and understand. So I decided, fine, if I'm stuck on construction, let me start a business. If I have to work in 
in this manner, at least let me be my own boss. And so I started to learn the trade. And then later on, I opened my own company. And then I was uh, I became a builder and life was really good. My Eldorado, believe it or not, was in Greece. We were making so much money. I was building houses for the richest people on earth, billionaires, famous singers, politicians, chief of police, uh, ministers in the cabinet, you name it. So I hang around with the political people all the time. And I was very good at what I was doing. I was building their little palaces, vacation homes. I hired sometimes over a hundred employees and um, life was good. However, you know, Europe, Greece was also very corrupted. So I had police officers coming uh, to my home uh, for envelopes uh, full of cash. We were building houses in national parks and and the permits and all those different things. If you wanted a permit, you had to bribe the politician. You had to bribe the police. Uh, it was that's how the business was done. And we were business people. So we kind of went into that system and we were sick of it. Uh, remember, we escaped corruption in Poland to find sanity in another country. And, and insanity found us in Greece. <clears throat> and after a few years of doing this, um, finally, as a family, we said, you know what? We just want to live a normal life. We want to do a business without the police coming constantly for bribes. We just want to be normal people doing normal business uh, without all of this uh, craziness. Uh, we had bank accounts. We were highly respected. We were living in a villa uh, by the sea. Um, uh, you know, we were sailing. Uh, our life was good. I mean, I was making a lot of money. My father had his own company. My mom was an esthetician. She had her own private business. My brother was going to a school in Athens. I life was good if it comes to finances. However, all this craziness around the running a business and, and dealing with Albanian uh, illegal immigrants, uh, it was just enough. So finally, we as a family, we decided, OK, uh, we don't want to live like this. We want to live in a country where you go to work, you get what you deserve, and you don't have to be subjected to illegal activities, bribery, uh, you know, a coercion and those different things. So believe it or not, uh, we emigrated to Canada for freedom, full stop, not for money. We did not come to Canada for bread. We had El Dorado. We were making tons of money in Greece. And um, just to give you in a perspective, I had so much cash, I could build a palace for cash. Uh, paid for, like no mortgage, nothing at the age of 20. So we were really, really well off, uh, but we were sick of corruption. We just didn't want to live like this. My wife was working for a private museum for a minister of culture. So we were very well connected, uh, parties, you, you know, like a high lifestyle, swimming pools and all those different things. Uh, but we were not truly free and we wanted freedom. And I, I don't know, it's a bizarre thing that we always wanted to just be free. That's it. My family wanted to be free, free from all of this craziness. So when we had the meeting in the Canadian embassy, because my father had offers to go to South uh, Africa, millions of dollars, like we would be even richer than we were in Greece. Uh, but, you know, South Africa, we were, we heard the rumors what they do with the white people there. Uh, so we didn't want to go. Uh, we, off we had offers to go to Australia, United States. Uh, but we chose Canada for a specific reason. After the meeting with the officer in the Canadian embassy, when he said to us, come to Canada, sell, because he knew we were self-sponsored. I don't know if you know the concept. We had so much money that the Canadian government says, yeah, bring your money to Canada. We want people with, with money. Um, so we were not sponsored by anybody else. We self-sponsored ourselves. And they said, sell everything you have. We have multiple you know, cars and businesses and equipment. And um, you know, we were building uh, stuff. And, um, and he said, come to Canada. And in Canada, no one will ever persecute you for your, phrase, uh, for your faith. Canada is the freest country on earth. So we had a meeting with, with, you know, with my wife, uh, with my uh, parents, with, with David. And uh, we decided, you know what, that's the country we want. Well, we, when a man can go to work and have a business without the cops showing up for bribery, without the politicians, you know, coercing you and, and, and threatening you and all those things, 
Uh, and that's what we wanted. And that's the reason we came here in 1995. And what did we do? We went to business. I became a very successful businessman. I had seven houses, properties, um, you know, uh, 400 oil paintings, sport cars. I tasted in Canada the riches um, again. But then it happened what happened with my, my, with my son, Nathaniel. And that was the defining moment in my life when I decided I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to do something. I want to help people. I want to save people. God blessed me with all those different things. Now I can give it back. All what I didn't know that few years later, I'll go through hell back and forth and they will steal everything from me. I've lost my houses. I've lost my sport cars. I've lost my properties uh, fighting this a craziness for 10 years from 2005 to 2015 i was fighting uh, the government attorney general uh, from uh, alberta attorney general from canada um, sometimes there were seven lawyers against us over 100 court cases and they bankrupt me i mean they literally destroyed me financially but i kept fighting you know they picked a guy that is um like my wife says a donkey a stubborn like a donkey i just don't bow to those people. I don't quit just because it's tough. It's it's hurting. I just keep fighting. I was a professional boxer uh, before when I was uh, young and I was a martial art expert and a teacher. So I was teaching police officers, uh, you know, all irony, uh, self-defense and other things. So I have been um, accustomed with pain and perseverance. In a sport like this, you have to have a character that just doesn't quit. You don't throw a towel because you know it's 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 hurting. You just keep fighting, keep standing. 2015, finally, I win. I win every single fight with those people. Um, court of appeals, criminal charges, um, provincial, QB, you name it. I win, and they leave me be for a while. And then 2020 shows up. Okay, now, uh, before we get into that, because people need to understand this, some people have only discovered you as a result of the Get Out, Get Out video, but you'd been fighting government corruption for a little while, even in Canada. Had you been religious growing up, and, uh, and or did you become, did you, did you touch God, see God at that moment with Nathaniel, where you decided to become a pastor? Uh, so Polish people during that time were all Catholics. I mean, you didn't have a choice. You were, you know, you were born there. That's it. Boom. You're Catholic. So my mom every week would send us to the church and I knew deep inside of me. I always knew there is God, but I didn't know him. I didn't know how to serve him. I mean, you only know what you hear once a week for half an hour. And that's it. So I was part of that. Um, and then. I wanted to serve God. I always wanted to do good things. So I even enlisted into a monastery to become a priest uh, during that time. Uh, however, what I saw within organized crime, as I call it right now, uh, was unbelievable. The level of corruption within the religious establishment, it was so shocking to me. So, for example, my older um, brothers in a faith, uh, parties, drinking, women, left and right, craziness. And then on Sunday, you know, purity and, and it's just, it was fake. So I remember one day I was looking into the mirror and I said to myself, do I want to become the biggest hypocrite? that there is, because I know I will have women. I know I'm going to do all different things. And yet in front of the world, I will be pretending that I am somebody else. I cannot live like this. So literally I walked out and I vowed never to go back to church ever again in my entire life. I said that they are worse than the mafia. You know, at least when you pay the mafia off, they leave you be, but the church, they always wanted more money. So I said to myself, they're worse than mafia. And then I met my wife. I met my wife in Greece. She was a Christian, but not the one that I remember growing up as a kid. She was a, a believer in the Bible. She actually read the Bible and she believed in what it says. And she was telling me about this God, this God of love, that he accepts you the way you are and, and he wants to change your life and, and he hates corruption. When I, when I heard that, he hates corruption. So those people that claim to be his servants were actually working against him because he hates corruption. As Catholics, we were really never reading the Bible. 
we were really never encouraged to to read the Bible. Uh, so I started to read one. And my wife, you know, women, I'm telling you, they're the most powerful. They are the most powerful people on earth, women. And it's like not the prime minister or the president. Women, your wife is the most powerful. And um, the love that I had for her and, and, and she asked me to take her to church and I did. And I just didn't want to have anything to do with them. I remember I was reading some criminal books while the guy was talking, the priest, or, you know, the, the pastor was, you know, blah, 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 blah. I didn't want to listen. And one day, finally, I said, OK, this is kind of getting crazy. I'll sit with you and I'll listen what this guy has to say. And I'm telling you what happened to me. I, I can't explain except that God touched me. I'm listening to this guy. He was a Greek pastor and he was telling people how much God loves you and he loves you with unconditional love. And I started to cry. And, and, and why is this important? Because I was a, a teacher, a martial art and boxer, and you don't cry. You never show emotions in public because that shows weakness. And, and I always said that this word is like an ocean with sharks. When they smell blood, they will finish you off. And yet I'm here sitting in public crying. I could not understand what, what was happening to me. And I think that for the first time in my life, I understood that God loves me just because I am. He created me and I am and he loves me. And that was such a powerful revelation. Fast forward, I became a Christian. And uh, of course, uh, we emigrated to Canada. We went to, to church. I uh, started to work with the church. I started to pay for different things. My business was doing really, really well. So I, I bought stuff and I uh, organized uh, uh, dinners for the homeless people. I started working with the homeless people in 1999. It was my first homeless man that I took off the streets. I rented him apartment, uh, fed the guy, bought him tickets uh, to Europe because he has never seen his grandson. Um, and that that's how the journey started. Me doing a little bit part-time, just a part-time. I was a businessman, I used to own a magazine. Uh, my office was in Bankers Hall, the most prestigious place in the city of Calgary. Um, I had development company, I had the building company, I had other businesses on the side. Uh, we were doing really, really well. And then I started to give back to the community. In 1999 was my first homeless man. Then I did it once a week. I would go with a group of Christians and I would start helping them. 2005, finally, I decided I don't want to live like this. I don't want to be a businessman anymore. I walked from my office and I have never went back and I became a full-time pastor in 2005. I'm doing this for 18 years full-time. Okay, that's amazing. And people are going to be blown away when you first run into difficulty with the government and why you ran into difficulty with the government. I now know from the interview with your son, it started because you were possibly arguably too effective at dealing with the homelessness problem in your area, more, more effective than the government. And there's money to be made in not solving the problem of homelessness. So explain to those who might not know how you first ran into trouble with the government. Well, first of all, I was very naive. I know a lot of people are very naive. When you look at the government and especially Canadians, you're being brought up uh, to respect authorities, uh, to respect the government. The government is the good guy that is here to help you. Uh, the cop, uh, the police officer in, in uniform is to save you. Those are the good people. And I, 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 I wanted to believe that. I had a great respect for the uniform and the authorities. And then in 2003, uh, when I started to organize bigger events and we had seven locations 250 volunteers 2004 and then in 2005 uh, we were so successful at that time i didn't know the homelessness is a multi-billion dollar business because you got to remember i had money at that time i walked away from business i had properties i could always sell another one i was very well off i, I didn't need it uh, government support so i just did what was in my heart I was a good organizer and I started to take those people off the streets. Within three months, in 2005, we took 600 people off the streets and the police shows up. And I'm thinking like, I don't understand. I, I, I should get a medal for what I'm doing, not a ticket. Then I started to ask questions. 
and it was those questions that got me in trouble. So I was, I had my TV show, I had uh, my radio show at that time. Of course, since then I was kicked out from every platform, um, and um, it was very successful, a very um, um, popular. Uh, my show was a, rea a reality TV show, Evangelism in Action. It was the most popular show on television at that time. I think I was one of the first that actually took the camera to the streets and showed the lifestyle of drugs, alcohol, prostitution, um, homelessness, uh, tent cities, etc. That was 2004, 2005. Anyway, going back to the story, I started to ask a simple question. The government was saying we are designating $2.3 billion to fight homelessness. And I simply ask the question, where, where does it go? Money? That's it. That's what I did. And I did it on television and I did it on the radio. And I kept asking, where is the money? I remember I was interviewed at that time by um, Rutherford. He was the most famous radio host in the country at that time. And he was so upset with me um, uh, for asking those questions. I said, listen, it's, it's a simple question. You're putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the, pro uh, into the problem. I work with the homeless people. I don't see any effects of this money. Where is the money going? Because I feed them. I clothe them. I look for jobs for them. I take them off the streets. I had a uh, halfway housing at the time. Uh, but I don't see anything that you're doing that actually is effective. So anyway, believe it or not, that's where the police showed up. After me asking those questions on uh, TV and radio. And the police said, uh, well... Giving free goods and services is illegal, distribution of printed material, or congregating, preaching, uh, everything. I mean, literally, I, believe it or not, I had a diving team, uh, firefighters with a special divers that came to harass me because they said uh, there is a report I am drowning people in a river while I was baptizing people in a river. So <laughs> I went through all of that. That was that was a crazy time. It didn't matter what I did. I ended up every second day I was in the news as this great villain, lawbreaker, troublemaker. No one cared that I'm saving lives. I'm feeding thousands of people. By the way, I do that to this day. And that's what got me in trouble uh, during the COVID, yeah. feeding the poor. So fast forward, um, uh, they had this plan to end homelessness within 10 years. And that was the big thing in the province of Alberta, 10 years to end homelessness. And I was the only one that was telling, uh, it's not going to happen because you guys are crooks, you're thieves, you're stealing the money. Um, uh, believe it or not, the city of Calgary, the mayor at that time, Dave Bronconia, took me to court. And guess what? Drop-in center, which is the biggest shelter in the province of Alberta, took me to court. And the master seat, which is the Christian, so-called Christian organization, took me to court as well. Why? Because a system, and I didn't know that at that time, and for you people to understand why they hated me so much, uh, because the system works this way. The more cattle, the more heads within the shelter, the more money is being allocated uh, by the provincial and municipal government. So if you have a thousand people under your roof, thousand times the allocation of the money designated for this, we're talking about millions of dollars that someone was losing because I was so successful. So the shelters took me to court because I was too good. Uh, we didn't charge a penny. And we were highly successful because in the end of the day, what? Uh, how did we do it? Well, everything was run by volunteers. Volunteers know people. Uh, they know um, uh, business owners that would like to hire someone, right? So we started to shift the people, halfway housing, job. And then off the halfway housing to their rental property, right? Boom, 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 boom. A job led to something else. They're off the streets, off the drugs. Then another interesting part of the story was that I started to hear from the homeless that the drugs are being pushed from the shelters. It was the shelters that were providing them with uh, drugs. It was actually the head of the uh, supervisor of the um, uh, drop-in center that was distributing drugs. So we're talking about 1,000 people within your fa facility. I mean, it's a perfect 
cover up operation so i started to talk about that then i got death threats uh, they hired an assassin uh pistols uh, uh knives were thrown at me uh, etc so from one hand i had the government chasing me down and then from another i had uh, a corrupted uh, drug dealers uh, if if you look at just the drugs one homeless person normally takes about hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a day worth of drugs that's why they have to push drugs themselves, right? It's a perpetual, never-ending, revolving door uh, situation. So we took, in 2005, before the authorities showed up, we took 600 people off the streets. 600 people times the allocated money that the shelters were losing, that's millions of dollars, plus those 600 people are no longer buying drugs. That's additional millions of dollars that someone somewhere was losing. Then the mayor got involved. Then the premier got involved. Then the media got involved. And it was like, what's going on? Now, of course, I know because we went to the courts. I was able to see the manufactured documents. Believe it or not, police were making stuff up, manufacturing documents, uh, the 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 counselors like Joe CC and Drew Farrell, you know, I openly talked about them and they never took me to court for deformation uh, because I have the evidence. They were making stuff up. The complaints were coming from City Hall to the bylaw services, from bylaw services to the police to shut me down for disturbance. Um, I was charged with uh, stunting. They said when you feed the people, it's a distraction to the motor vehicles. Right. And it endangers the public. I mean, in sanity, you know, I was charged with placing material on the ground because they said when you bring your tables, that's placing material on the ground. And that's also prohibited by law. I, I, I thought when I was talking about it with Nathaniel that they would get you on like, you know, you have to have a permit to serve food because they're worried about listeria or whatever. Um it's it's, it's so you're you're dragged through these court your court battles for years because you're feeding the homeless um because you're offering services that people don't seem to understand this but they really should appreciate whether or not you know whether or not they fully appreciate it there's an industry of homelessness in california every i mean in everywhere and there's the incentive it's like you say you lose there's not as much funding when there's not as much of a problem and therefore there's very little incentive to solve the problem almost an incentive to not solve the problem so you go through this for a decade um, we don't need to get into how it ends, but if you could gloss over how it ends and then what you do between 2015 and the end of the world as we knew it, March 2020. Yeah. So first of all, for your audience and for you, I had permits. I had all the permits. I did everything by the book. Everything. I mean, you got to remember, I'm a businessman, right? I was a businessman. So you need a license, you need permits, you need bank accounts. You, you know, to run a successful business, you don't do a Mickey Mouse you know, and I was a good at what I was doing. So I had everything they wanted me to have. Health inspectors, uh, approvals. I went through the, you know, food handling. Um, I'm, I'm registered. You name it. I had the permits. I was paying for the permits so I can feed their people. I had to pay, but I did it. I did it because I love people more than, than those few bags that they required me to pay uh, for the permits. So, which is about three, four thousand dollars a year. Um, but they revoked the permit after they came and they said uh, that uh, actually what you're doing is illegal now. So they took my permit away illegally, manufacturing the stuff that was illegal, according to them. So I fought, I fought, I fought. I was uh, the first Canadian ever to be arrested for publicly reading Bible. In 2006, seven officers, I faced a year of imprisonment because uh, the police officer said to me that reading the Bible now is considered offensive and I am not allowed to read the Bible in public. Tom King's Park in the city of Calgary, I get arrested. No amplification system, uh, just six parishioners. I'm reading the Bible, boom, get arrested, handcuffed, forced to move walk backwards, faced a year of imprisonment. I won that uh, after $123,000 later, but I win. And uh, they leave me um, alone if it comes to, um, you know, being arrested, but they, they uh, come uh, with other charges. Um, and then eventually, 2008, I have become the first ministry that 
uh, my charitable status was revoked and the federal government sent me a letter saying that because I speak negatively about abortion, homosexuality, and divorce. So if I was speaking positively, that would be perfectly okay. But because I speak negatively about those three topics, I am not eligible to have a charitable tax st status. So everything they did was leading towards one thing, to destroy me financially. So people would not donate to what we're doing, and then eventually I would just be destroyed and the trials the millions of dollars in legal fees uh the craziness right 2015 i win my final battle in a court of appeal in a provincial courts and my permits are restored so they had to give me permits back because the judges said that the cops were lying cops were manufacturing stuff um, one judge um, went after them and said, everything you said is just a lie, what you did to this guy. So that kind of scared them a little bit. And they restored my status. They restored my uh, my um, permits. 2015, I'm left alone. 2020 shows up. I, am, I have a permit. Everything I'm doing is by the book. Everything is done by the book because that's how I always do it, by the book. If the law is not against the Constitution, Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Criminal Code of Canada, I'm not going to follow a made up law from the pit of hell like the COVID time, but I follow the law. I'm a law abiding citizen. So you want me to file for a permit? I did. So I did it. 2020 shows up. I get a letter from the city hall and they said, well, we're in the middle of this crisis. You must stop feeding the poor. I'm like, if we are truly in the middle of this crazy, you know, crisis that you're saying that we are my services are needed more than ever because they said we're shutting down shelters and we're shutting down soup kitchens i said you people don't make any sense so i appealed it to the mayor i appealed it to the premier i appealed it to every minister and here is what i said what do you think is going to happen to 15 to 20 thousand different individuals that are facing homelessness roaming the streets of calgary if you kick them from shelters and if you will not provide necessity supply you, you, you saw what happened to someone in in montreal he uh, a homeless person died in a porta potty because the shelter kicked them out for reasons of COVID. i mean we, so we well, saw what happened we have hundreds of people that were literally murdered by what the government did in in alberta hundreds if not thousands hundreds for sure they were murdered by what the government did. And because I work with the homeless people for 24 years now, 24 years, I mean, I know what is going to happen because I've seen it. I know uh, human nature. You know, when you work with those people for such a long time, you know, the government doesn't know. The politicians don't know. The media do not know. I do know because I work with those people. I have a, a huge... Uh, you know, I have volunteers, I have facilities, uh, we feed thousands of people every single week. So what I said to them, um, I'll tell you what is going to happen. Thousands of people are going to roam the streets, they're going to whack your grandma's head, they're going to break into a garage, they're going to break into your house, they're going to break into a grocery store, because humans need to eat. If you don't provide them with necessities of life, they will get it this way or that way, but they will get it because they will have to don't do this our services the soup kitchens are now needed more than ever and their response was 12 officers health inspectors bylaw police they assaulted one of my parishioners pushed him shoved him stay away two you know six feet apart or two meters apart and he kept coming and pushing the guy um i was threatened with arrest um i became the first canadian as you remember, to get a COVID ticket, $1,200, I was threatened with a million dollar ticket and an arrest. So what happened was I kept feeding the poor. I mean, that's what I do. They kept showing up. Uh, during that time, I end up with over 40 COVID tickets for feeding the homeless. The culmination of the story for 2020 came uh, during Christmas. I don't know if you remember. Uh, the politicians went on television and they said Halloween is perfectly okay. Kids have fun. Just be careful, blah, 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 blah. And then just a few weeks later, the same politicians went on television, provincial, municipal, federal. And here is what they said. I don't know if you remember. We must cancel Christmas. We're canceling Christmas. The chief of police goes on television and says, I'm going to send patrols 
constables, and if they will see extra cars in front of your house, we're going to break in and we're going to arrest everyone. A brother cannot come for a coffee, no family dinners, no Christmas dinners, uh, no celebrations, nothing, zero. Uh, you can take the entire church to Costco. You can take your entire church and half of the neighborhood to Ikea, uh, but you cannot have a brother for a coffee. So when I heard that, I went on television too. And here is what I said. I'm inviting people to the biggest Christmas celebration in the country. And I'm going to be serving AAA steaks, uh, gifts for the homeless, and we're going to have a great time. I also invited my entire family and my friends to the biggest Christmas uh, dinner that I could master. And I sent pictures uh, publicly say, come and get me. You know where I live. So what they did, um, they showed up. I've never seen something like this before, of course, under communism, I saw it, but not in a free and democratic country. I had over 100 police officers showing up for my Christmas celebration, for my church service, 52 police cars, 20 cops on bicycle, anti-terrorists and the chief of police. And according to them, I did, <coughs> I did the unthinkable. I did the unthinkable. I had something that the government on all levels said it's uh, as deadly as the Kiroshima and Nagasaki. I was having carolers. At, at that time, you were not allowed to sing. As you remember, no Lord's Supper, no Holy Communion. You are not allowed to sing. If you sing, the whole city is going to collapse and die. I hired carolers and we were singing Christmas songs. So I end up with, you know, the cops showed up bearing gifts. I end up with 15 COVID tickets for that horrible crime. And two years later, I had a trial for that, and I won. I won every single trial uh, during that time, except the last one that we will uh, talk about later. So that was 2020. Then they started to show up in our church, in a building. So I pastor two churches. One, it's called Street Church, streetchurch.ca. It's a church for the poor. I mean, everyone is welcome. We don't ask, are you poor, are you rich? It doesn't matter. If you're standing in the lineups to receive food, barbecues, no problem. Everyone is welcome. No one is asking you questions, you know, what is your political stance or your homosexuality or, you know, uh, uh, sexual preference. It doesn't matter. If you're standing in the lineup, that means you need our services and we'll feed you, we'll uh, counsel you, we'll pray with you, whatever you need, we're going to do it. And we have testimonies and we have worship people are singing and it's like kind of um amazing picnic if if you will that's on the streets three times a week we feed the homeless people but three times a week we also meet in a building like a regular church building um and i pastor that i teach theology and history because i realize that canadians are not being taught history so they need to know that this is a simply a repetition of history, that those villains have done this before. So that's what I do. And believe it or not, first of all, 2021, they they blocked our driveway, driveway to the church, preventing parishioners from coming. But, you know, parishioners, so I have amazing people. They're lions. They're not afraid of the hyenas. So they just packed in a different place and they walked to the church. It took me an hour to fend off those hyenas. Then they showed up with telescopic cameras um, and they were taking pictures of our women and children. Those are the tactics of the Gestapo and the, and the Soviets when I was growing up. If they couldn't get a man, they would um, intimidate our man with, hey, we know where your wife works. Uh, you know what can happen to your 13-year-old daughter? Well, I'll tell you what can happen to her, right? So... Those were the tactics of the old, and those taxes, ta tactics were implemented uh, now. And then um, for the 2020, every week, I had from 5 to 20 officers at every street church service. And I would end up with the ticket or harassment or intimidation. So for people to understand the get out video, I have been under pressure, harassed, intimidated, and ticketed and vilified everywhere in the mainstream propaganda media every week every week i was being attacked uh, by those villains and then april of 2021 comes this is the holiest time of the year for the christians and the jews it's a passover celebration it's a big deal for us and then i turn to my left 
and I'm like, I'm shocked. It took me a, a second to realize what is happening. And I went to the pulpit, I grabbed the telephone and I started to film. Why? Because those people were lying about me so many times. I don't trust a police officer. I don't trust Bilo. I don't trust health inspector. I don't trust politicians. They are liars. They're manipulators and they have no problem to manufacture stuff, to make stuff up just to bring you down. I've seen officers testifying under oath um, bogus stuff, like ridiculous things, making stuff up. And if it was not for our cameras, if it was not that I was uh, having a proof of witnesses, I would be imprisoned by those people. So I start to record and I told them, get out. Uh, it took me over 30 times to tell those people. Here. Out. We're, we're going to, we're going to refresh everybody's memory right now. It still, it still makes me angry to listen to, although I remember saying, I remember saying at the time, Arthur, they're going to come back with a warrant, <laughs> and, and sure as sugar, they did. Please get out. Get out of this property. Immediately get out. Okay. Get out of this property okay. immediately. Out. Okay. I don't want to hear anything. Out of this property okay. immediately. Okay. I don't want to hear a word. Okay. Out. Okay. Out. Okay. Out of this property okay. immediately until you come back with a warrant. Out. Okay. Out. Okay. Out. Okay. Out. Okay. Out. Okay. Out, out of this property, immediately out, immediately go out and don't come back. Don't, I don't want to talk to you. Not a word. Out of this, pro out of this property, immediately out. I don't care what you have to say. Out, out, out of this property, you Nazis. Out, out. Gestapo is not allowed here. Immediately, Gestapo is not allowed. Out. Do you understand English? Get out of this property. Just look at look at Go. that. Look, look at this. So just just sitting there, armed guards, armed armed police, just staring at you. I. Uh... So go, go, and don't come back without the warrant. Out, Nazi. Out. Out. You understand? Nazis are not welcome here. Out. And don't come back without a warrant. Do not come back without a warrant. You understand that? You're not welcome here. Nazis are not welcome here. Gestapo is not welcome here. Do not come back, you Nazi psychopaths. Unbelievable, sick, evil people. Intimidating people in a church during the Passover. You Gestapo, Nazi, communist, fascists. Don't you dare coming back here. Can you imagine those psychopaths? Passover, the holiest Christian festival in a year. And they're coming to intimidate Christians during the holiest festival. Unbelievable. What is wrong with those sick psychopaths it's beyond me oh yeah arthur I, I i remember watching it at the time and i've been a little i've been a little behind the curve sometimes but still more ahead than others and i remember saying hey, you might you might have overreacted and now i look back on it and i there's there was nothing else to say i mean i i i so do you remember now what were they trying to do there were they trying to serve you with with papers um, or were they were they there just to issue more fines or just just look around? They just wanted to talk. No, first of all, remember, I have been subjected to this craziness already for over a year. So here is a guy that has been hunted down for over a year. So those were not friendly people. They were not just here to have a conversation. They were hunting me down. I already received multiple tickets from those people. I think at that time, maybe 25 tickets those people issued. They just wanted to come to intimidate because I've told them, if you want to inspect the facility, you're welcome to do it. I have nothing to hide, but not during the Passover celebration, not during the church service. If I I'm may not... stop you there, were there people, was there a congregation going on? Were there people in the church at that time? Congregants, I mean? There were some, I mean, it was not yet, it didn't start it. So I was not already preaching at the pulpit. It was just the beginning. People were mm -hmm. gathering 
and they wanted to just stay there for the entire service <laughs> to observe what uh, if we're keeping you know the distance and if they are the muzzled people there and you know i was told that i have to preach with a mask on and our worshipers were commanded to worship with a mask on i mean no <laughs> no you crazy people i just know too much about viruses and i know that the pathogen you're talking about it's 1000 times smaller than the bacteria and your pampers is not going to stop from this to come in and go out you're you're not going to fool me by your fake science you're just making this stuff up to try to subdue the people and i'm not going to allow you to do that here under my watch so they did come back you were right i was actually hoping you know, because people, when people watch me and, and they say, well, you're so aggressive and, and the words and this and that. Uh, actually, the truth is I'm a very peaceful man. I avoid trouble. If I don't have to, I will walk away from the trouble. But if I don't have to, if I cannot, uh, if I'm forced, I'll fight you to the death. And um, they did come back. You were right with the warrant. Uh, three weeks, I was hoping that they will just leave me alone. The video was uh, within the weekend was watched over a billion times. <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> you made it made it once it once I say once it makes it to Fox News or Fox News at the time, uh, that's when you know it's got the attention of of everybody. And very few people had anything bad to say about you or the video. And it was an embarrassment on our country, which is exactly the type of stuff that a tyrant doesn't like. Um, but hold on, I had one question before I forget. The blonde woman, was she Australian or British? Did she have an accent? Yes, I, I think she is British and she was the head. She is, I think, as far as I know, the head inspector. Like she is the big hancher. She's the, the big boss of mafia here in the province of Alberta. So she was the one that was sent to hunt me down. They sent the boss of bosses uh, to, to bring. It's very interesting because did you see her jack boots? I mean, she looked like a Gestapo of old, muzzled with jack boots. You know, what what I what I noticed is that her demeanor went very quickly from ah, oh, we just just very nice to like as she was being back down the stairs, she got visibly angry, and that that big guy sitting in the back, well, he was doing his best just to stare you down and and not move. Uh, no, I, I'm. Oh, I, I've either evolved or devolved, but when I listen to that now, with the last three years of my life experience there. Uh, it's almost like you, you don't know what else to say. Okay, yeah, they're not they're not wearing a swastika. They're not Nazis. They're behaving in a way that is purely tyrannical. They're they're not there to impose justice. They're there to impose injustice. What is anyone supposed to do, short of getting violent? I mean, that's as violent as one can get with words. If words can be violent, what else is be polite? Please come back later. Oh, and then and then she just keeps trying to ask you a question instead of just leaving. And I'll just, I'll, and, and then it's like it's like the open the door. Well, I asked you one question. Now let's talk. And it's just watching it in retrospect. Um, yeah, it, it's um, it, the world needed someone to say it. And there's, line. and there's more to that. Um, you got to remember what they did was illegal. So what they were doing, they were breaking a criminal code of Canada, Section 176, 1, 2, and 3. You're not allowed under our law. Um, you know, they came holding the badge and they were there in the name of the law but they were breaking the law under our criminal code of canada you're not allowed to intimidate harass or interfere or stop and a person that is officiating or is about to officiate is on his way to officiate or is doing it or is coming from officiating a religious uh you know thing um you know service so they were clearly willfully breaking the law and people are coming uh, before the service starts i have ten thousand things that i have to do um you know there's already people um praying there's already people uh getting ready for the worship you know we get the instruments you know it, ta it, it takes a while to put this put this on and they entered the building uh wanted to have a, a conversation and observe with all those armed officers you know historically speaking even during the middle ages i mean the dark ages right the, the the soldiers were required to leave their weapons outside they were not allowed to enter a church because it was a sanctuary and, and historically speaking the churches were always the places where even the villains could hide 
until the real justice it could be administered you couldn't just lynch someone okay let's enter the church no it was a refuge for the real justice to catch up to come but here we got villains entering illegally breaking the law and they want to have a conversation while i'm about to perform my duty as a as a pastor no get out you wicked evil people so they did come back i was hoping that would they would not three weeks it took them and here they went and they found the crooked judges the first one was um david gates david gates and i don't know if he's related to bill gates the devil of america but you know our gates david gates of alberta believe it or not gave them the power to enter our church anytime they want with whomever they wanted to come so they showed up with swat team to a peaceful assembly to a church swat team shows up so when i saw them i i just said get out that's it i would not allow them to enter the building get out so they showed up again we stood by the door you want to arrest me arrest me but i will not allow you to intimidate people in the middle of the church service get out so they leave and they went and they found another crooked judge, this time the boss of judges, the associate chief justice, at uh, John Rook, the crook, as I call him, John Rook, the crook. This guy gave them the power to enslave four and a half million Albertans. Do you remember? He gave them the power to arrest children, men, women. It doesn't matter. Anyone that dares to oppose the holy cow of Canada, the health inspector, could be arrested and charged with contempt. And that's what they did. That, they that, and so for everybody who appreciates that, that's what, they, I, as far as I remember now, they came back with, with um, a warrant. I think it was a warrant or authorization to serve. And it was to serve the notice to outlaw public gatherings, private gatherings, et cetera, et cetera, which would be imposable by contempt on anyone with knowledge of the decision. Or as far as I remember at the time, anyone within the province. So this, this court order, which prohibited public gatherings and a bunch of other otherwise normal constitutional behavior, it became uh, contemptuous potentially for any Albertan to violate that public health order. And that's one of the things that they needed to serve on you in order for them to be able to arrest you later on for knowingly violating that court order. That's right. That's exactly okay. right. Uh, you know, single uh, handedly, this judge enslaved four and a half million Albertans uh, with this swooping order, um, according to him, that you must obey me. I'm a new tyrant. I'm the king of kings right now. And if you don't, then you can be charged with contempt and arrested, thrown in prison. So the anti-terrorists showed up again with those documents. Uh, I was not I was never served with that. Uh, my brother David was. I was never served with this. I was already preaching. So when they came, when the anti-terrorists came, opened the door, was standing room only, packed church, max. You couldn't find a, a seat. And they opened the door and they realized, okay, this is going to be a bloody thing. Uh, there's too many of, of the people. There's hundreds of people packed. How are we going to drag this guy from the pulpit while he's already preaching? And I remember when they opened the door and they wanted to move in, someone yells from the back, Gestapo is here. So I knew... I'm coming down. I, I knew this is going to be uh, a crazy, and um, but they didn't. I think they realized, okay, this is going to turn really ugly. If we're going to try to drag this guy while he is preaching, um, it could go, you know, in, in a bad way uh, for them. So they waited. They waited for the people to go home, and um, I went to a car. Um, a friend of mine, uh, David Hughes, was driving. And my brother David was with me in the car and we got stopped by the anti-terrorists, by the SWAT team in the middle of the highway. This, and, this is it right here. That's right. So you got, I, I actually now, I didn't fully appreciate this. You got pulled over on your way back from your church. Again, breaking. They were breaking the Criminal Code of Canada, Section 176, 1, 2, and 3, where it clearly states you're not allowed to do that while the person that was officiating a sermon, a service, a religious service, was on his way home. I was on my way home when they did that, clearly breaking the section 170. Uh, look, look, look where they have. To. I'll, I'll play this. I don't know if this video has the full arrest, but arrested repeatedly, including a 51 day incarceration that drew oh, national gonna, gonna attention. He was even arrested on a tarmac and one time for simply planning to attend a public rally. Well, there's an update after uh, all of those hardships. The Court of Appeal of Alberta 
has handed Pastor Arter Pawlowski and his legal team what they're calling a big victory. Yeah, that, that was it was a short lived victory. We're going to get to that in a second. So yeah. they put the, the first time. And I remember seeing the video of your arrest and, and people were saying like, well, you know, just 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 go with him. And I forget where I saw you say it. you're like, no, I'm going to make them. I'm going to make a spectacle of this and not go quietly because you go quietly. Nobody knows that you've gone. You make a spectacle in the most necessary and useful possible ways. And the spectacle gets picked up, amplified, and becomes a source of shame for the regime. They haul you off the street. Um, in, it, it's a busy street. Like they, they could have, I guess, followed you home. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yes. What, what were you going to say? Yeah, yeah. No. So, so you, you've got a valid point. Um, why? I mean, uh, there, there's all kinds of ways to arrest an individual. And you got to remember, I was arrested multiple times. So they can call a lawyer and say, "Well, there is a warrant for your clients." Um, and and can you arrange uh, your client to go to the police station, mm -hmm. right? I mean, what would I do? Voluntary surrender. It's and and you'd go and you'd get your charges. They'd release you unless they don't, and, and that's the way it happens civilly to avoid accidents, conflict, escalation. There's a reason that's for right. it. That's right. But he, he, here is the thing: they were doing this as a symbol. They were doing this as a spectacle. That's why in the middle of the highway, this was like a takedown of El Chapo, Al Capone of Canada, <laughs> right? And they needed this to be that way to send a message. They were sending a message. They were doing a spectacle. They were doing that. I didn't ask to be arrested in the middle of a busy highway by anti-terrorists. Are you kidding me? No, but then I decided, fine, if they want to make an example out of me, because that's clearly what they were trying to do, I will make an example out of them. And instead of going along with their plans, I said, you want to play a Nazi? Do the Nazi style, okay? I went to my knees. I put my hand behind the back. Hey, you want to be a Nazi? Then you are a Nazi now for the whole world to see. So then my brother David uh, was to uh, hold as well. But I'm telling you, I paid dearly uh, for that because when they took me to the paddy wagon, uh, they placed me upside down. They tortured me for two hours, driving me around uh, Calgary, downtown, stopping, watching, laughing. So here is how they put me. They put me upside down, my head on the ground and my feet up. It was a very small, uh, you know, a van just for one inmate. And it was so small uh, that my feet would not fit, uh, you know, inside that, that 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 space so the police officers the two of them they were talking to each other and said okay well I'll just charge him with assault um we're, we're going to just say that he kicked us okay so we can add more charges and then i realized those people are mafia those are criminals they are real criminals they are cooking stuff up and they're going to try to hurt me even more so i helped them to fit, uh, to put my feet inside, but because it was such a small place, uh, my feet were up and my head was on the ground. That's how I traveled for um, over two hours. And they would stop sometimes, and the cops would come out and look at the mirror and uh, at the window, and they were laughing and and talking, and and then off we went again. So I spent with my brother David three days and two nights on concrete, which is also illegal. When you're, uh, when you're being processed, you are to be processed uh, within 24 hours and either charged with an offense and uh, released or put in a room on, you know, to have a bed and a room. But they didn't that. They did not do that. Three days, two nights, we spent on concrete in the most filthiest cells you can possibly imagine. And of course, all of that was done to us in the name of health. Yeah, right? COVID. <coughs> COVID and <coughs> it was the most filthiest. Filthy. Uh, when I sat on concrete, I got stuck to the floor because it looks like they did not wash that for months. It was sticky. It was ugly. It looked like someone urinated all over the uh -huh. place. It I'm, was unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure someone did. But just back it up a little bit. So they put you into the paddy wagon. Your hands are cuffed behind your back. Correct. The entire time. That's right. That's right. And so, and the idea is that you know people are free to believe or not believe or think you're exaggerating. What we have, call in French bon de, like you know if you're if you're whatever. But the idea that they have you behind your back, so they're trying to put you in the paddy wagon. Your feet are sticking out, and you're not putting them in. And they're saying, well, if he kicks us, charge him with assault. And so then you you basically say, look, I'm going to fold my legs up. They're going to close the door. And then you spend 
whether it's an hour, two hours, an extended period of time on your chest with your hands behind your back in a position that we know is not a position for anybody to be uh, put in for an extended period of time. Well, actually it was worse. I was, um, I was on my back. So my feet were up like this and I was on the back by on your hands down on my hands. And that uh, caused my uh, wrists uh, trouble that I have to this day. I had bruises and scars for over a month. Um, that's how tight they handcuffed me. And my full body was laying on my handcuffed um, wrists behind my back. It was extremely painful. I mean, torture. That's the only thing I can describe this. This was hours of torture and they knew it and they were laughing uh, about this. So uh, on Monday, um, after being kept three days and two nights on concrete, we saw the next crooked judge, Adam Germain. Adam oh, 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 sorry, stop, stop there for one second. They arrested you on a Friday? They arrested me Saturday. Saturday. So they, you, they know you're not. Yeah, that's it. So you're, you're not seeing. You're not seeing a judge anyhow until at least the next well, the next open business day, Monday. They like the Friday arrests. You get sometimes Saturday and Sunday in there instead of just Saturday. Um, yeah. Next judge you see on a Monday after two Adam, nights in, in 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 a cell with nothing, no sheet. I mean, what's nothing, nothing, just yeah. concrete, just concrete, extremely painful. And my 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 brother has a back problem as well. It was it was very painful. Uh, then we got shackled. You know the Penguin March. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with this. You know. Um, shackled feet like criminals and oh they, they had they had they had tamara leach in shackles when they bring her in front of the judge and the judge says why is she in shackles like what, what, uh, well this judge yeah. didn't say that uh, this judge didn't care because i'll tell you what he said he said he started his proceedings uh, which was a shocker to me he said i received a con uh, phone call from john rook again remember john rook is the one that enslaved four and a half million albertans with that swooping uh, order uh, that anyone that opposes him will be found in contempt. That's the same guy that is the associate chief justice, which is the boss of Adam Germain. So now Adam Germain tells us on the record that his boss just called him and says, well, would you take care of this case? And he says, I agreed. Oh, yeah. So now I turned to my brother, David, and I said, that's it. He's a political activist. This is not the judge. And, and let, let, me, let me stop you there. It's not the... Will you handle this case and stick this guy in jail for an extended period of time? That's not how the corruption works. It's wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Would you handle this case? I don't need to tell you what to do. And now this guy's in charge. Got the call from from what you say from the uh, coordinator, the the chief of justice. I'm trying to look up what his position is. Um, but he gets calls. Says, "Can you handle this? He knows damn well what to do. What what, what happens to you uh, after two nights and three days?" Yeah, because um, you, you know you got to add uh, the dots together. Um, Adam Germain works for John Rook. John Rook did that order that now we are being arrested for. And he calls this guy, Adam Germain, says, hey, can you take care of this, right? It was my order that they violated, that they broke my order. So I want you as my, um, you know, um, a good, good friend uh, to take care of it. So here is what happened. Adam Germain starts to talk about CNN, CBC, uh, he says we're in the middle of a uh, pandemic. We, uh, you know, people are dying and and the virus, and we have to protect. And uh, I look at this like he is acting in a capacity not of a judge to look what happened, the merits of the case. No, he's looking at the narrative from the politicians and the mainstream propaganda. And I said to David, he's not the judge. That's it. We were already lost. This trial didn't even start. We already lost. So that's where I decided to go to the States when I was released on bail to share my story to Americans. Why? Because I said to Americans, look what is happening behind the Iron Curtain now in China. And it's coming your way unless you rise up and come to the rescue. This is SOS. Canada has been taken down. We've lost accountability, checks and balances. And I was right because you remember when I arrived back from my tour in the United States. Your, your second your second glorious uh, uh, extravagant arrest on the tarmac. Let, let me let me bring something up before you go further here. Uh, Arthur, I want to read this. This is from Alberta Health Services. I won't read the whole thing, although that's not that long. Uh, Edmund, this is back in the day. What's the date on this? Because I think it's outdated now. There is no date. A preemptive injunction against anyone who is organizing, promoting, and or attending an illegal public gathering that does not comply with chief medical officer 
of health order requirements remains in place. A preemptive injunction, anyone. Alberta Health Services was granted a preemptive injunction on May 6, 2021 in the Court of Queen's Bench, this is when the Queen was still alive, against both the operator of the Whistle Stop Cafe and all other organizers of advertised illegal gatherings, yada, yada, yada. Following a request by the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms and consent of the AHS, because the first one went, the first one was a little bit too broad, Associate Chief Justice John Rourke, Rook amended the May 6 order by removing the words independently or to like effect. This wording does not change anything in the order with respect to those individuals inciting or organizing others to breach chief medical officer, whatever, have health orders with respect to large gatherings. AHS strongly condemns the intentional disobeying of COVID-19 public health restrictions, un unless it's a unless it's a BLM protest or, or something to that effect. Um, of course, I saw BLM actually marching on our streets. I was there and I was making a comparison. I just got arrested with my brother David for just having a church. And look, there is thousands. There was 5,000 people on the streets of Calgary. No problem whatsoever. Many of them were not wearing a muzzle. And, and somehow that was perfectly acceptable, okay, scientific, and and healthy. Well, well, Ar Arthur, remember Teresa Tam said, if you're going to go, don't scream. Just bang things together to make noise. I mean, this was there was a New York Times article that said, is protesting dangerous? Well, that depends on who's protesting what. Almost literally the headline. That's so you, right. get, you, you get back from what is nothing less than a humiliation tour of Canada in the States. I think you went on Tucker that time? Yeah, I was all over. I was on, uh, um, uh, you know, Sky News, um, Newsmax, um, Fox News multiple times, uh, Bannon, um, you name it. I was on the biggest outlets um, and I was in person. I had sometimes 15,000 people listening to um, to what I was sharing um, in about 30, 40 states. I was flying all over the place. I was supposed to go there for a few days. Uh, Clay Clark conferences, the reawakening with uh, General Flynn, uh, Mike Lindell, you name it. I was a keynote speaker uh, during the meetings with governors, uh, state senators, uh, Congress people. Um, so I was all over invited to churches, um, town halls, a meeting with Tea Party, Republicans, uh, dinners. I've met um, a Trump family. So I was doing my best to share my story with anyone that would be willing uh, to listen. And then I um, called my lawyers when the time finally for me to come back was if there are any warrants. Uh, she called uh, the Crown Prosecutor's Office. No warrants for my arrest, Not be no problems. Um, when I was in the air, the warrant was activated. I arrived. Our plane was actually taken from a normal place where we were supposed to arrive to like multiple other tarmacs. And then we were taken to the customs and the police officers were hiding um, inside the customs building. It was so pathetic. And when I stepped out, I was immediately arrested, taken to the customs. Uh, I was charged with uh, criminal charged. I was criminally charged with inciting um, people to come to an illegal gathering, participating in an illegal gathering, officiating an illegal gathering, not wearing a muzzle. I was criminally charged for baptizing my daughter in a river in a public park as well. Um, you name it, I was charged with. Also, uh, customs looked at me when I was there and they said, we will search everything, everything. So I think they were hoping that I was smuggling something, that they were hoping that they have something illegal so they can pin that on me or they can, you know, make stuff up. Another thing is they broke into my computer illegally. They broke it. They searched everything. They look for whatever they were looking for. Um, and they would not. I was arrested. So I was taken to the police um, station. Uh, to the spy hills, to the processing unit. I was released on bail again, and they would not give me my property for, I think, for a week. All my electronics, um, all my you know, computer that was broke, uh, broken by the customs or whoever was um, doing that, all of that was not given to me for days after I arrived. L l um they arrested you. I think it was for breach of breach of your bail, right? Contempt of con it was for contempt, as far as I recall. But Arthur, you have to refresh my memory on the timeline. People may have forgotten about your bail conditions, and I think that's what you got arrested for, which was violating your bail conditions. But I might be wrong. But this was from the order. 
a requirement that during the period of his probation, when publicly speaking against AHS Alberta Health Services order, health orders and health recommendations, that while you're exercising your free speech, Arthur, that you say the following things, qualified speech provisions. This is what you have to say, Arthur. I am also aware that the views I am expressing to you on this occasion may not be views held by the majority of medical experts in Alberta. While I may disagree with them, I am obliged to inform you that the majority of medical experts favor social distancing, mask wearing, and avoiding large crowds to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Most medical experts also support participation in a vaccination program unless for a valid religious or medical reason you cannot be vaccinated. Vaccinations have been shown statistically to save lives and to reduce the severity of COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, people may have forgotten the compelled speech aspect of your of your bail terms. Were you arrested for breaching your, your bail terms? Was that the arrest for contempt? No, no. Actually, I was arrested for inciting people to come to church, officiating an illegal gathering and participating in illegal gathering. Okay. Because I got to remember, I kept feeding the homeless and I kept the church open. Like everyone could come into the church and participate in the worship. I never stopped doing that and that's what they uh, nailed me for contempt of court because i kept doing what was prohibited uh, by adam uh, by um, john rook's order um uh, what you're talking about is later on because adam germain remember the the body of john rook he found us guilty all charges found guilty uh we had to give like uh, tens of thousands of dollars in penalties and then that's you know his ruling he put us on probation and also gave us the compelled speech. I'll never forget that because we were outside the court. Uh, Rebel News was there and I said to them, I'm going back to prison. I'll never obey this order. There's no way I can. I'm a pastor. I preach the truth. I don't preach the lie. I'm not a CNN reporter or CBC reporter and they want to turn me into a CBC reporter. So what I did, I grabbed the microphone and I said, Judge, I hope you're listening. I'll never, ever obey your order. Um, so if you want to arrest me, you can come and arrest me now. My brother David grabs a microphone, and you can still watch it. It's it's on the internet. Um, and he says, Judge, I hope you're listening to me. Your order, you can shove it where the sun doesn't shine. And I turned to my brother David and says, that's it. You finished us off. There's, <laughs> there's no way we can survive this. I mean, what I said was uh, problematic, but now that's it. You ticked him off. But he didn't arrest us yet. Uh, we I attended a rally and coming from the rally, I was arrested by RCMP in the middle of the highway again, then released on a promise to appear before the judge. Then we attended a protest with my brother, David, and my son, Nathaniel. And they, coming out of that protest, we were followed by the police and we got arrested in the middle of the highway again and in the middle of the snow, put in jail and released on probation again. So now they were piling things up. Like, I mean, the mountain was getting bigger and bigger. Well, and I know, because now I'm, I'm getting confused. I, I'm confusing myself as to when that court order was issued and in respect of what the, the well, I guess. Like, I think many, it was November, September or uh, September. October. That no, that 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 judgment was from December. Uh, as far as let me just let me just put it back okay. in here. So but, Adam Germain's ruling was after I arrived from the states, and I arrived after September. I think in the middle of the end okay. or the end of September of 2021. Every every time you get arrested, how many days are you spending in jail? Depends. Um, my latest was 50 days, but usually it's a day, two, three. Um, so I guess depends of of their humor that day i i don't know because normally the law says that you have to be processed as fast as possible and then taken and given a, a bed right because they can't keep you on concrete but with me i was always a concrete treatment and of course when the truck convoy came i'll share what they did to me in prison after uh, and that's why i am in trouble right now i was charged over 40 times five arrests uh, during the COVID era alone, when the trackers came, I was already very well known. They called me the, you know, the freedom pastor, the Canada's pastor. So the trackers called me right away. I mean, before when they were organizing, they called me and they said, hey, would you do a church services for us when we arrived in Calgary? And would you feed us? Because that's what I do. I feed thousands of people. We, um, we, we can really easy because we have everything that we need, feed masses kind of like, boom, we can bring trucks, boom, 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 and we can feed people outside. So I said, of course, 
of course i mean what you're doing is amazing and uh, they arrived in calgary i did a church service in the evening my church fed those people we managed to get truckloads of food and other goodies for the truckers to go and i was supposed to go with them um, but i didn't i'll tell you why the next morning uh, they asked me to do another church service so we had worshipers we had prayer a mini sermon I, again we had food for them off they go to ottawa i was supposed to go with them i had the cars and everything they wanted me to go with them however my wife came to me and says okay so if everyone goes to ottawa what about the people in calgary we have 15 to 20 000 people coming every single saturday in calgary who is going to be their pastor here who is going to speak at the rallies here so i decided to stay and that's where milk river started milk river and could so i got a phone call from truckers and farmers from milk river and Coots. Coots is the border between montana and alberta and they said uh there are police officers with machine guns and and they are pointing at us and people are getting depressed would you come and cheer us up that's what they said would you give us message of hope would you do a church service and lord supper for us so i took my son nathaniel i uh, loaded the car with the food uh, we brought a worshiper with us larry and speakers and we went to milk river here is what i saw in milk river in milk river was absolutely beautiful every color young old children families dogs cats horses you name it it was what canada was always supposed to be all about it was the most beautiful thing i've ever seen on this soil a real solidarity a, a real canada a part of everyone there were atheists there were muslims there were christians everyone was there for one purpose freedom that's it. So we fed each other and, and it, it was beautiful. I did Holy Communion. I did a service, a sermon. Um, when I came, the roads were open. When we left, the roads were open. The only blockade that was there was done by the RCMP. And they filmed me. They took pictures. Um, we had, um, you know, I did the mini sermon and we had singing. We were singing songs and hymns and national anthem. And I went to the headquarters there to the RCMP and I said, listen, I uh, got invited to go to Kutz. I would like to go over there. And um, and they said, fine. Okay. They opened the barricade for me. Listen to this. It was RCMP that opened the barricade for me. And I went to Kutz. It was about 12 kilometers over there. Mm -hmm. I was taken to a private property, Smugglers Inn. And I did the same thing. We were singing hymns, national anthem. I was praying for people. We had uh, Holy Communion. And I did 19 minutes sermon to the truckers. Here is what I said. I reminded them about history that I saw, Solidarity Movement, uh, the you know shipyard in Gdańsk, uh, Lake Wałęsa. I told the people that to stand up for God and state given rights, uh, to hold the line, to do it for the children. And I told them three times during my 90 minute speech, do it peacefully, no guns, no swords. And I repeated that a few times, peacefully. This is a Mahatma Gandhi style. This is solidarity style. This is Martin Luther King Jr. style. We don't fight with them. We just paralyze their system by refusal to cooperate. When millions of people will decide not to cooperate with them, not to work for them, their system collapses and we get our freedoms back. No one stopped me. No one said a thing. The RCMP undercover were there. Uh, no, a bit, not a big deal. We left. Um, no one stopped us. We went to Milk River again, hang around with the people, had uh, some more, uh, I think, pizzas. There were pizzas over there. Went home a few days later. I stepped out of my house and I'm telling you, this was truly a takedown of Al Capone of Canada, El Chapo of Calgary. There was undercover police, uniformed Calgary police, anti-terrorist SWAT team with special camera unit filming everything. There was our, uh, there was the tech detectives, there are RCMP officers, craziness, blocked the entire street. I was arrested, taken to the police station, interrogated for hours, taken to Riemann, stripped naked, put in solitary confinement. I spent 45 days in solitary confinement. 
Um, and uh, next day was the biggest shocker because they took me from my cell and they put me in metal cages, like you see in the movies, metal cage like this. It was absolutely crazy. It was so hot. I was suffocating, no water, nothing. Um, they denied my access to lawyers for three weeks. They confiscated my Bibles. They would not give me my reading glasses. They took even my write up for the lawyer's eyes only. And they confiscated that as well. So I couldn't communicate what was happening with my legal team. And that was going on for three weeks. The lawyers were calling. They were being put on hold for sometimes an hour or two. And then they would hang up. And that was every day. They would prevent the lawyers from coming and helping me. I was taken from my solitary cell, taken to another one every night on concrete. No water, and no um, bed concrete cell, a little concrete cell, uh, no washroom. 45 days later, share, uh, 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 an officer comes to me and says, Palaski, you have a visitor. So I go over there and I knew it's odd because I knew my family is not going to visit me. Uh, maybe a lawyer, but lawyer would tell me uh, that uh, they're coming. So I knew there's something odd. And they took me to admission. There were sheriffs waiting for me. I was literally kidnapped shackled like an animal and taken hundreds of miles away to Edmonton to another city without the knowledge of my legal team, without the knowledge of my family. They took me to Maxpot. Maxpot is a prison for the most dangerous offenders, for terrorists. Um, this unit is for hundreds of inmates. I was the only inmate in the entire unit. They gave me a document and they said they're going to keep me there indefinitely. Like, like, you, like you're watching movies that you're going to be rotting there forever and ever. And uh, freezing conditions, minus 20, uh, 28 um, outside. Uh, they cranked the air conditioning. No, They would not give me an extra blanket. I, um, I called because I was considered uh, the most ex you know, uh, dangerous offender. Uh, they said I cannot even have a pen because I'm too dangerous to the staff and the facility. Um, I, I, I was told I cannot have any interactions with another human being, only on intercom. So I phoned them and I said, listen, it's freezing. I'm shivering. I can't sleep. I can't function. It's, it's, it's very, very cold. And they laughed at me and they said, at least you have fresh air. So I called my wife. I got 20 minutes outside of my cell. I called my wife and I said my goodbyes. During that time, there were already five inmates that uh, testified to my lawyers that the guards were giving them incentives to murder me in prison. So I said to my wife, my wife, I think they're going to finish me off. I'm freezing. I can't function. It's too cold. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to do. Maybe talk to the lawyer and maybe the lawyer can send a letter to the judge because I'm not coming alive out of this ordeal. It's three guards that are guarding me. I am alone in max spot freezing to my dad and there's nothing I can do about it. So she did that. My lawyer sent a letter to the judge explaining the situation. And that's what scared the Riemann Center. Riemann Centers are privately owned businesses founded by the government. So the next day, judge hears about what is happening to me. And believe it or not, she <laughs> it was fascinating uh, because um, it scared them so much that they came to my cell and they took me and they placed me in another unit, psych ward, without the evaluation of the doctors, without the knowledge of Alberta Health Services, completely illegal. How do I know that? Because a doctor comes to me on the second day and says, Mr. Pulaski, what are you doing here? I said, well, guards came, took me here and I'm here. Like, I mean, I don't have much say in what is happening to me right now. It says, you're not allowed to be here. Um, what they're doing is illegal. That you cannot just put a sane person with insane people without the evaluation, without even our knowledge. We don't know what is going on. This is illegal. So I spent a week there, and then eventually I was let off on bail, put on house arrest. I'm still talking to you 16 months later on house arrest. I'm still on house arrest. So then eventually we saw the trial judge. And here is a fascinating part of the story. The Crown Prosecutor accused me of causing Canadian economy over $400 million worth of damages for my 90-minute speech. He compared my speech. I'm the first Canadian ever in the history that my words, my sermon was on trial. No witnesses called. 
the entire two days trial was word by word what I said and the interpretation, the lawyers and the crown were interpreting what I meant by what I said, certain words. He oh. said that my words, he compared my sermon, 19 minute sermon when three times I said peacefully to Rwanda genocide. And it's on the record. Ezra was there tweeting, reporting. It was insanity. He compared my peaceful sermon to a hurting Canadians to Rwanda genocide. And he said Art Pulaski was inciting murder on other people, like a man that wants to murder people. And guess what? The judge agreed with this pathological liar, Stephen Johnston. Stephen Johnston is the Crown Prosecutor that was personally assigned from a special prosecutor's unit for this case. More to the story, the judge was handpicked by government. He's a judge from a completely different area. He was brought to look into this trial by the government uh, from a completely different place. And the judge said that, yes, I'm a criminal. Everyone that took part of the Freedom uh, Truck Convoy is a criminal as well. I'm the first Canadian ever to be found guilty on inciting mischief. <laughs> and I am the first Canadian ever to be charged and now found guilty on interfering with the crucial infrastructure under the Defense Act, which is like eco-terrorism and the breach of a release order. So my sentencing was supposed to happen yesterday, but they pushed it again to September 18th. Arthur, uh, people are going to listen to everything you just said, and some people are going to have a great deal of difficulty believing it. And now, I, I the, whether or not, like... It's set aside details that some people might say exaggeration or hyperbole or whatever. You were in jail. They detained you for 45, give or take, days. Here is yeah. a document that states I am the most dangerous person. That was given to me. And later on here, it states that they can keep me, keep me in this hell indefinitely. And and they do not. You're denied bail, I presume, or you're not released because of prior violations of prior court orders. Do they do they explain this? Does your lawyer file like a, a writ for habeas corpus to show me Art Pavlovsky's body so I can know that he's alive and well? So what happened was the during my first bail hearing, the Crown Prosecutor Stephen Johnston. Uh, said, I am extremely dangerous. I am a multiple offender. I have this huge amount of other charges that they piled up on me, criminal charges. And again, remember, all of my charges are not related to any criminal activity. All of them is either I fed the poor and I was told not to, or I kept the church open, or I would not wear a muzzle. I have a medical exemption. And I never uh, wear a muzzle, including prison. And they were forcing me and they were trying every possible coercion that they had I, i'm not i'm not wearing that stupid thing if you're afraid put triple on if that's what makes you feel so, some, some people were doing that arthur <laughs> yeah i i know and and that's fine if you want to be that stupid that's up to you but you're not going to make me stupid i'm not going to fall for this i'm not nobody's dog um you know you try to put the muzzle on my dog and he will bite you but I guess if you put the muzzle on people, they will love you for it. So it's a bizarre uh, thing that we have witnessed. Um, but because of the criminal charges piling up, uh, when I was arrested, they activated multiple other charges. So I think I was 20 or 30 other charges that were activated while I was already in custody and, and criminal charges. Again, I was charged for baptizing my daughter uh, when she was uh, 12 in 2021. Uh, how dare you in a river, in a public uh, park, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, criminal charges, um, inciting people to come to church, officiating in illegal gathering, participating in illegal uh, gathering, uh, participating uh, in a protest, participating in a rally. So all of those things, they activated. And then when the judge heard all of that, Crown Prosecutor Stephen Johnston presented this like, this guy is extremely dangerous and he doesn't follow orders. He has contempt. He has criminal charges. Oh, okay. He was charged here and there. He was told not to attend a rally, but he did it anyway. He was told not to go to protest, but he went there with his brother. Like, this guy is super dangerous. You must keep him because he's not going to follow your orders, your honor. And she looked at me and says, yeah, 
pretty much. He's yeah. a criminal. And she Ar kept Ar Arthur, I you are ideologically dangerous. I mean, I get I guess it in the world in that world it makes sense. I want to bring this article up. This is CBC reporting on it. Uh, Calgary preacher guilty of mischief for urging truckers to continue Coots border protest. Arthur Pavlovsky was on trial for violating Critical Infrastructure Act and breaching bail conditions. And I want to get to the part where it says um, solidarity. Maybe it's not in here. Y you have to explain to people. Uh, we touched on it right at the beginning, and I wanted to come back to this, and we're coming back to it now. The reference to solidarity. And in that speech, that's the incitement to mischief, the incitement to violate the Critical Infrastructures Act, because you um, invoked the solidarity movement, which is is you know is attributed to having ended or caused the fall of communism in Poland. Can you flesh that out for those who might not be familiar with what the solidarity movement was? Yeah, I think that's the biggest shocker out of this whole story because uh, solidarity movement was a peaceful, like like I said before, um, Martin Luther King Jr. civil rights movement, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was peaceful. When millions of Polish people finally said in 1980, enough is enough, and in solidarity with each other, that's where the word comes from, in solidarity with the hurting, in solidarity with the ones that were subdued by this great tyranny, communism and socialism, went together and organized a strike. It was a general strike. What? What? How did that look like? Well, the people just took it to the streets and not in a non-violent way, and they refused to work. That's what it was. Uh, as simple as it is, it was the most effective way to destroy the wannabe virus. People simply said, no, that's it. We're not working for you anymore. We're not going to work. That's what it was. And the, and the communists collapsed because of it. So what I was saying to the truckers, look, who can stop a million truckers? Who can stop a million people that will decide to paralyze their system by the refusal to work for the system? It would be over just like that. I mean, within a few days, we will have our rights back because they will have no infrastructure to punish us. Because when people say enough is enough, that's it. And I think that's the most dangerous message that I was giving to the truckers because they realized, oh, this guy is up to something. Solidarity in Poland destroyed this tyranny uh, that crippled half of Europe. And this solidarity of today might destroy our tyranny if people will catch the fire if you know what i mean so uh, the crown prosecutor said that the solidarity because when i gave my sermon to the truckers i had a hoodie that said solidarity and in the back it says with god we win with god we win and those are the two messages god is bigger than your idols and if we come together it's over for the villains and those this is this is the nutshell of my sermon, the 90-minute sermon to the truckers, and of course, do it peacefully. So the Crown Prosecutor during my trial said that somehow solidarity was a violent coup against government in Poland. I could not believe it. <laughs> this guy has uh, audacity to, to attack something that freed Europe from the boots of the biggest and the most vile empire uh, during that time. And yet he did it and the judge sided with him. Um, it's unbelievable. What was the date of that trial? Give it or take. February. February 2023. So it's after the public, uh, the public order emergency commission. Yes. Uh, it's after the ruling i think on that it has to be after the ruling was it after or before commissioner hulo's ruling do you remember i don't remember okay and it doesn't really matter except to say that they're finding you guilty of inciting mischief because you gave a speech which said protest the way they did uh, in the solidarity movement in poland which was peaceful just don't work and cause the system to come to a grinding halt and the judge said yeah that is inciting mischief in canada a country which in theory has a charter of rights um, that allows for peaceful protest, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. And you're facing, it's not an exaggeration, you're facing upwards of 10 years in jail? Uh, even more, because the inciting mischief and the mischief charge, which is like a thought crime, has 10 years attached to it. It's a criminal offense with 10 years of imprisonment. But plus, I was found guilty on eco-terrorism, where later on the Crown Prosecutor Stephen Johnson withdraw. So I'm already found guilty. I'm a terrorist. And then the Crown says, by the way, we are staying that charge. 
And then on top of that, I am uh, I have been found guilty on uh, breaching the release order, uh, which has additional punishment mm-hmm. attached to it. So it could be potentially even more than 10 years. It uh, depends how they're going to play this. But what, that's where the bribery and coercion and, and uh, blackmail uh, comes into effect. Because you got to remember, I have become a leader of a political entity in the province of Alberta. I am a leader of Solidarity Movement of Alberta. Solidarity Movement of Alberta.ca is a political party right now. So I'm not only a pastor, I'm a politician right now as well. And I started to receive bribery after bribery. I'm telling you, it was shocking. Oh, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to get into that now, but just back up for one second, because I think a lot of people probably don't know this. You have Did you start the Solidarity Party or was it an existing party that you joined um, to run for office? No, no, I started it uh, brand new. I was part, I was elected by thousands of people into another party during that time called uh, Independence Party of Alberta. And nine members of the board were bribed and they, believe it or not, when I became so popular, I was traveling around Europe, I was uh, uh, around Alberta, uh, my town halls, including where the premier of Alberta uh, has her office. We had 500, 600 people showing up to listen to our platform. We have become so popular that I started to receive phone calls and emails by the, by the board from my own party. Uh, that said, um, we don't want you to expose corruption. Don't talk about WEF. Don't talk about the jobs. Uh, don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. And I said, listen, uh, that's what I was elected because people want me to talk about those things. And I want to tell them what is going on. So eventually, now I know, of course, that it was bribery and, and uh, they were told to do that. At that time, I didn't. Uh, they were told to remove me from my office. So I was elected democratically by thousands of people and nine members of the board removed me from being a leader for the Independence Party of Alberta. That was how dangerous we have become. Later on, I decided, fine, I have to um, start my own party that we control the board because this is the game they have been playing for a while. Every opposition party, everyone that is getting a momentum is being infiltrated from within the board. So the board is the key. You have to keep the board clean because thousands of people can love what you're saying. Thousands of people can can be part of your party, but the board decides if you are staying to be the leader. So Did they I- have to... I'm sorry, did they have to offer a reason for your removal? Or is it just within the rules, within the purview, enough people vote, you're gone? No, not even that. You see, if the people if, if the people would be given the opportunity to vote, if those thousands that elected me would say, yeah, but we don't like you anymore, and they would vote me out, I can live with that. But it was not done this way. No, it but what I mean is... It, 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 if the board, the board has like six, or if the board majority votes to override the will, like if that's baked into the rules, were, was did they give a reason or was that baked into the rules? Whatever the, the masses voted, the board has the final say to remove for whatever reason. Yeah, so here is what was told to me. I, uh, I was told not to talk about God, but of course I was elected because I do talk about God. I'm a pastor and I told them from the very beginning, I'm not going to stop about, I'm not going to stop talking about my religion, full stop. If you want a man like this, uh, we had Abba Hart, we had Manning, uh, there were two premier's pastors in the province of Alberta. And, and I'm going to be the next one if that's your will, but I will not give up my fate. Okay. And the second, don't talk about the grooming. I started to uh, oppose the new law within the city of Calgary uh, about the drag queen story hour mm-hmm. uh, when they're grooming uh, children, where the pedophiles are uh, getting a hold of our children. And I started to talk about this. It was very popular. Our videos were extremely popular. People loved that we're defending the children, but the board said, never. That's it. You can't talk about this anymore. They told us not to talk about the jobs and don't talk about um, WEF and, and all the globalist agendas. And I told them every single time, um, I disagree. I think that's what people want to hear. That's why we are so popular during our town hall meetings when we have packed houses wherever we show up because they want to hear about this. So I disagree with you and I will keep talking about this. So then um, in their reasoning, they said, um, my vision is different than the party's vision and therefore I cannot be a leader anymore. So we created... 
uh, the Solidarity Movement of Alberta, where every elected person will be free to represent those people that elected him. I don't want the party line. I don't want to force people uh, that the party is moving this direction. You must. You see, it used to be where the community was voting for you. You were actually representing that community. And every community is a little bit different. I want to give that freedom back to people. Also, I was advocating for referendum. And that was a big shocker for the establishment because I said, if ever God wills it that I'm elected, I will bring a referendum at least twice a year where people will be able to vote as majority how they want their province to look like. On the key issues, people should be given that opportunity, not just few elected or selected officials. Also, I was advocating for the provincial police. I was talking about anti-corruption force that actually would go after the judges, crown prosecutors, uh, police officers, and the politicians. And I was advocating for the election of judges. Not Judges right now are being appointed by politicians, therefore they are no longer judges. They're political activists uh, for the party that elected them, uh, chose them, appointed them. I want the judges to be elected by the people, that the people can el keep electing them if they're good judges. Uh, you know, right now we have a system where there is absolutely nothing you can do with the judge. Adam Germain is such a perfect example. He broke the law. He uh, gave me a compelled speech um, and my brother David. Uh, he made stuff up. And there is really nothing you can do. He's still a judge in the province of Alberta, even though uh, we were vindicated, as you remember, with the court of appeal, when the judges, three judges said everything that was done to us was illegal. My arrest, my brother's David's arrest, all of that was done illegal. The judges broke the law, but there are no consequences for them at all. So I spent time in prison. I was, you know, vilified, attacked. Uh, they tried to burn me alive, uh, alive, as you know. They put my house on fire uh, in the middle of the night. We almost were burnt alive. They unscrewed tires of my truck. The wheel just took off. My church was vandalized for three months. Uh, they broke into the church. They stole our equipment. I was physically attacked multiple times. Uh, so those actions of those judges have consequences and yet there is nothing we can do about it so this was the platform i was forwarding and it was highly popular so someone said okay we gotta put a cap on this the guy is getting too popular too many people like what he's saying so i was kicked out and that's where i formed our own political party uh, registered within the province of alberta at the solidarity movement of alberta.ca i hadn't actually had i, I don't remember remembering uh about the uh, arson did, did, i'm gonna ask a stupid question did you file a police report over the uh the arson every single time we're being attacked we file a report the cops show up for example when the police came for the arson they said well there is nothing we can do about it because like we don't know i mean i will then do your job right uh, when they unscrewed the tire in my pickup truck uh, the police actually came angry and they said, what do you want us to do? Well, I catch the people that did this for a change instead of catching moms that are driving kids to school for speeding. Just go and catch the real criminals. And they were super angry with us, super angry. And of course, not once. Listen to this. I, I know this will be a shocker or maybe not. Not once they contacted us back. So we're filing, we're telling what is happening. Um, you would think that sometimes they will call back and, and update you on how the investigation is going. Nah, nothing. They don't care. Our church was vandalized for three months. They put our children's bus on fire, trying to burn down our church and um, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Uh, the, the cops will come because they have to by law. They will do the reports and they will never contact us uh, back again. So um, this is the reality we're dealing with. Uh, they're useless, as useless you can be. Uh, they are no longer peace officers. And by the way, every single time they were showing up, uh, the peace was gone. They were always the ones that were bringing aggression and people were not feeling safe when they showed up. Until they were not there, 
people had great time and and was very peaceful the moment they show up is is craziness as you know my son nathaniel was uh, detained uh, uh josh alexander was arrested by the calgary police uh for nothing like the guy did nothing he was within his rights uh, with the youngsters over there and the bible was burned in front of the police and the police didn't charge them with a hate crime i mean try to do that with a homosexual perversion you will be rotting in prison forever but they can burn our bibles in public no no problem there's no. nothing to see here I, I'll, I'll bring it up every time i have an opportunity you know they'll they'll go so far as to fake hate crimes like joel harden faking a a, a hate crime hoax if it had been real, I just keep saying, if that had been a real hate crime, we'd still be hearing about it today. If it were a conservative that had faked a hate crime, we'd still be hearing about it today. But it's, you know, politics ruins everything. It's, oh. um, but our, Arthur, the and, and, they, oh, but, and then they wonder why churches are burning in Canada, which they don't report on until they have to because American outlets start picking up on the rash of church arsons in Canada. Um, I, now there's, I know you gave a, a public speech about it, so I'm only asking what I know that I you've already mentioned. The bribery, the, the, what you allege is bribery, what you allege are people coming to contact you to say, we can make this all go away if you play ball. Um, I know that this is public because I watched a video of you say this already online, so I'm not saying anything private, but can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so uh, this is politics, right? Um, when I was released from prison uh, and I became a leader of a very popular party that was uh, uh, on the rise, uh, again, we had thousands of members and more members were buying memberships and town halls full of people interested in what we were offering. I started to receive, um, uh, I started to have people, actually physical people coming to my home. Um, and, and during those meetings, I was told that if I join uh, the conservative party, uh, then uh, first they offered me um, a, a being a chair for a public inquiry that uh, Preston Manning uh, later on took it, $250,000. Um, they offered me to be a chair of that and uh, look into the COVID craziness. And I said, well, that's awesome. I would love to do that. But if I will find dirt on your ministers, if they actually broke the law during the past three years, uh, what kind of a power I'm going to have? to go after those people. And they said nothing. You just have to bring it back to us. So you want me to investigate your government. And if I will find something, there is nothing I can do about it. So you want me to be your pup puppet. That's it. And I said, no, I'm not interested in your $250,000, a fake job just to keep my mouth shut. Um, then they came back again and they offered me um, uh, that this trial uh, that was before the sentencing. The trial will go away. They will fix the problem if I will uh, join the Conservative Party and, and everything will go away. I told them no. So they came back again um, a month later. And, and again, for people to understand, all of this was all over the news. Daniel Smith, the premier of Alberta, um, a promising amnesty, running for office, winning because of people like us, because she promised mm -hmm. amnesty. Uh, she says she's going to bring uh, Alberta's own police force. She's going to do reforms. Uh, she's going to look into the COVID uh, craziness. She made statements that politicians did this. Now politics has to fix it. So we looked at that. So like we wanted to believe that she is going to do what she's promising to do. Of course, uh, now we know she was lying from the very beginning the phone calls i had multiple uh, multiple interactions with her representatives about 10 uh, during that time and including talking with her uh, also so when she was making all kinds of promises going back to the story the last one was if i abandon my party if i stop being the leader of my party and join the conservative party they were going to give me a guaranteed seat at the legislature so think about that so i'm running for office i want to be elected so i can actually represent the people and mm -hmm. fix this problem or at least be the eyes and the ears of the people inside so i can tell the people what's really going on because we are running blind and deaf there's no one there that actually defends us and fights for us there's three thousand albertans still subjected to the COVID tyranny so uh, that sounded really good, but they said you must abandon the people and come to our side. And I've told them no. 
I'm not a Judas Iscariot. I don't do this for money. And I'm not a whore of Babylon that goes to bed with every monkey that is offering something. I'm, I'm not, you know, if you're looking for that, go to Pierre Polyev. Uh, he is perfect example of a, a flip-flopping politician or Daniel Smith. She crossed the floor before uh, when we were in a wild rose together because you got to remember Daniel Smith was the very one that killed our movement a few years before when she abandoned the people and joined the conservative party because she was promised that she will become the deputy premier. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm not her. I don't do that. I don't do that stuff. Um, so that was going on for eight months, about 10 different me meetings, including a personal phone call with the premier. Um, then uh, when I finally said to them, oh, you're not hearing me. I'm not for sale. I, I'm not crossing the floor. I'm not doing what you're doing. You think that's your mistake. You think I'm just like you, corrupted to the core. I don't do this for money. I don't do this for politics. I'm doing this for my children and for the future of my children and the children of other people. So then the coercion and blackmail started to happen. For the past two months, I received phone calls from fixers. They call themselves the fixers. And if I tell you the names of those people, your hair would stand up. They are... Big names, big names. So here, uh, here, what I was told, okay, allegedly, here are the conversations. So they called me and they said, listen, we can fix your problem. Um, we own the judge. The judge is bought and paid for, and he will do what we are telling him to do. There was a meeting with Stephen Harper. Again, this is what I was told. There was a meeting with Stephen Harper, the ex-prime minister of Canada, a meeting with Jason Kenney, ex-premier that lost his position because of this craziness, and Pierre Polyev. And they decided that they have to eliminate you from the board game. They call this a board game. It's like some kind of a game for those psychopaths. And they have to eliminate you. And I said, what is Pierre Polyev doing in the middle of this craziness? Like, I mean, I know... Harper, he's in Calgary. I know Kenny, he's in Calgary. But what is this guy, the new guy? Well, here is what I was told. Because I'm exposing corruption within the conservative government in Alberta, and Alberta historically has been a big conservative bastion uh, for conservative federally, I'm jeopardizing their next federal election. So therefore, here is the offer. And here is what I was told. I have to give them $100,000 as a payment for fixing my problem and $50,000 to the choice of their charity. I must withdraw myself from politics and I must stop talking about politicians. Those are the three things I must do. If I will say yes to those three things, my problem will go away. And I say, how are you going to fix my problem? I mean, I'm already guilty, right? According to this judge. Oh, that's easy. And I was shocked. That's easy. Um, what do you mean easy? Well, the Crown Prosecutor can come with the judge and they can decide that um, uh, the, the charge, that they can lesser the charge. So from a criminal to just an offense. And your problem is fixed. You're not the criminal. Uh, you will pay. It will be a, a slap on the wrist. Um, you will just apologize and, um, and, and, and the offense will not be a criminal uh, and everything will just go away. You can go back to your life and you can travel and everything will be will be fixed. So that was going on for about two months. Finally, they realized I'm not biting. I'm not going to take that deal. Uh, they called me and they said, fine. There was a, another meeting uh, with those people and they've decided that um, pack your bags. You're going back to prison. The judge was already ordered. That's how they said the judge was already ordered to put you back in prison. Uh, because you're not playing the ball. So uh, this is uh, where we are at. I mean, no matter what the judge um, Gordon Crinky uh, will, will do or say, in the end of the day, um, we already drafted an appeal. Uh, we're going to file the appeal. Either those people were telling the truth or not. I don't know. Uh, but I'm just telling you, after the bribery, which I've heard um over and over again from the people from the premier's office. And of course, I had a conversation with her myself. I know that the bribery was real. 
if it comes to blackmail now and coercion and either the judge is bought and paid for, of course, I don't have any proof for that. Um, but it's kind of interesting that that's how they're playing their game. And I said, wh why, why conservative federally is so concerned? And that's what I was told, because they are afraid that it will trigger on the federal conservatives, what the corruption, the level of the corruption within the province of Alberta is going to hurt the federal election against Justin Trudeau. So here we are. I was supposed to be uh, in a court yesterday and uh, sentencing was supposed to be rendered, you know, whatever the judge decide, decided to do with me. Um, it was pushed to September 18th. Here is an interesting twist, and I want this this will be the first time I'm telling this publicly because I'm a little bit worried. Um, first of all, those are very dangerous people we're dealing with, but I'm a little bit worried because I just received a letter from the probation officer. So I am on probation. I have a probation officer. I am on house arrest. I cannot leave uh, after 7 p.m. without the written permission. And it's crazy. And, and, and this has never been done before in the history of this country that the pastor... Uh, his sermon was on trial, and now I'm a house arrest for 16 months. Um, but here is what worries me. She is suggesting that I should be uh, taken um, and evaluated by a psychiatrist or psychiatrist, psych psychiatrist, uh, a psychologist. Yeah. Um, that maybe perhaps I was damaged when I was growing up um, under the Soviets, and maybe I need help. And she asked me multiple times, if I think I would benefit from having a psychiatrist or psychologist, um, you know, having some kind of sessions. And I said to her, listen, they call me. I actually counsel psychiatrists and psychologists because they're so messed up uh, that they need help. So I'm not going to turn myself into a person that I counsel because they are suicidal. So here's what worries me. Why am I telling you this? What worries me that Soviets... North Korea, China, they always are using the same tactics. If they cannot deal with the political dissident this way or that way, they always will bring them into a psych wards or mental institutions so they can drag them with all kinds of stuff so they can mess those people up. So I'm telling this on public that if this happens, if this actually happens to me, it was because that's how they want to deal with me as a political entity, as a leader of a registered political party within the province of Alberta. They will try to maybe damage me with some kind of uh, jobs or, uh, you know, for, you know, drugs or, or, or whatever uh, other things. You got to remember when I was in prison for 50 days, every single day, twice a day. So just wrap your head around this twice a day. The nurses and the guards were coming to my cell, offering me at least five different heavily addictive drugs, fentanyl, cocaine, and some other stuff. Five different heavily addictive drugs were offered to me and other inmates, not just me, twice a day for the entire time I was locked. So that's how they deal with the revolving door. They hook you on heavy drugs, then they release you on the streets. But because you cannot afford, drugs are extremely expensive, you commit crime, so you've got the inmates revolving door, perpetual inmates coming in and out because they're being paid per head. Just like the shelters receive money per head, the remand centers are receiving money from the government per head. More inmates hooked on drugs, messed up people, the more money is coming. I, I, RT, I was just talking with someone recently who was explaining that in jail, you see the same people coming in and you say, oh, what happened? Well, they released them. They went to the shelter down the street. They got their fix. They ended up doing a, a break in entering or whatever, and they end up back in jail. They would see the same people multiple times a year. And when you talk, you know, it's it's the old joke. Um, I, I don't even want to make the joke, you know, but sell, they, they say like, you know, uh, Jeffrey Epstein says, you know, I, I'm not, I, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself type thing. In this case, we're talking about psychiatric evaluations and, and people, I'm taking Wikipedia just because it's a, easy to pull up. People don't appreciate this is a tactic. It's a Soviet tactic. Yeah. It's a fascistic tactic. Uh, institutionalize someone. And then you can justify everything and anything because they're a danger to themselves. That's I mean, right. it, it, was, it was systematic. 
in, in the early practice of my legal career, uh, we used to do these things called, not, the firm used to do motions for confinement. You'd go to court and you would have a doctor's assessment that says, Mr. X or Ms. X is a danger to themselves or others. They need to be institutionalized against their will. There was a threshold of evidence in theory, but we are in a world now where, cripe, get, get a doctor to evaluate you because you're, you're, you're belligerent. You're, doing, you're acting against your own best interests, Arthur. That they can institutionalize you, medicate you, and then and then you're done. You're discredited for life. Yeah, that's the thing. That's why um, my probation was asking multiple times during multiple uh, visits if I, you know, perhaps need that assistance. Um, and and <laughs> I know the tactics. I know that the moment you get into the system, it's done. Your rights are thrown out the window. So that's what they're doing. And I've heard, of course, multiple of other people that also. Um, were opposing or exposing corruption and they were treated uh, in the same way. So on the record, I want you to know I'm not suicidal and I don't need that kind of a help because I do counsel psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, they call me uh, as a pastor because they have multiple problems. They are hooked on drugs and they are antidepressants, alcohol, and etc. I don't use drugs. I don't drink alcohol since 1999. And, and it was very interesting because during the evaluation, that question was asked also if I'm using something. Well, I'm not using anything. I live a, a very healthy lifestyle. I Even when I have a headache, I don't take uh, drugs uh, because I don't need that stuff. You know, I'm a happy camper. I'm a family-oriented man. I take my children uh, places and I, I love to spend time with my family. I just hate corruption. Why do I hate corruption in such a crazy level? Because I grew up under corruption. I was part of the system, not intentionally, but I, nevertheless, to survive, to be successful, you had to be part of that criminal enterprise uh, called government uh, under the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And I hate it. I hate that with the passion. I hate when they come to me with bribery. Don't you know I'm a Christian? Don't you know I'm a pastor? I don't take bribes. Okay, so leave me alone. If you want not to hear about Arthur Polosky, stop this craziness. And you will never hear about me. Leave me be. Let me be a pastor. Let me take care of the homeless people. I'm, I'm the happiest man when I'm on the streets baptizing people and feeding the multitudes. Leave me alone. But they want, they can't, because they're bent on doing evil. We are dealing with a criminal enterprise that profits from homelessness, profits from people being hooked on drugs. And here I come and I become too successful in helping people that they want to be, you know, under the gun. They want to be under the boots of addiction or homelessness because it's a big fat business. Arthur, do you have a few more minutes um, to yeah, take sure. some questions? Okay, so we're going to end on Rumble, and then we're going to go. We're gonna, it won't change anything from our end. We're going to get some questions and some some rants. People have questions there, but just before we leave, the biggest crowd, your sentencing was postponed to September 18. Yes, September 18. I am to appear before the judge again, and he is going to decide what is going to happen to me again. My, I'm the I'm the first and the only. Canadian citizen in the history of our beloved country that has been ever found guilty on inciting has never been done. So we don't know. It's like the book is open. It could be, you know, a thousand years um, of prison. We, we just don't know because it has never been done. And, and here is why I want to end with this, because people may say, well, you're too loud. Uh, you're too obnoxious. To you, you, you're, you're just you, right? This is not a popularity contest. If they can get away with me, if they can get away with a pastor giving a sermon, agree or disagree with what I said to the people, but if they can get away with that and call that inciting mischief, which is a, a made up criminal offense and anyone can, you know, fit under that umbrella mischief. This is mischievous. That's mischievous. Uh, where the truck is mischievous or Bansi house that they erected in Ottawa. Was that mischief? Of course, according to the government that hates freedom, that's mischief and it has 10 years of imprisonment. So if I can be found guilty, well, you're next. Your, your broadcast can be uh, inciting mischief. If you tell people, uh, let's say you're a politician, let's say you're Maxime Bernier that is opposing the corrupted government. And if Maxime says something contrary to the ruling party, 
that could be called inciting mischief. How, how about you say to the people, let's come do a rally. And something happens during, during the rally, you can be liable of inciting mischief, a criminal offense. So that's how crazy this case is. I, I don't think people realize that this is the most important case if it comes to freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom of religion ever being judged or tried in the history of Canada. I think people don't think they don't care so long as they lay low and don't you know, don't piss off the government. You won't have problems um, until one day they want to protest their children's you know breathing conditions at school. And lo and behold, if you interfere with traffic, incitement, to, inciting, inciting mischief. Um, so September 18th, that's going to be your sentencing. In the interim, how can people find you? Well, if people, uh, as you know, Nathaniel testified before the European uh, Parliament um, and you interviewed him on that. And upon arrival, he was detained mm -hmm. and uh, he calls me a few times and says, Dad, I think I need a, I need a lawyer. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do upon arrival. The customs said there is a warrant. Um, you probably will be arrested upon arrival. So I hired a lawyer, $10,000 retainer, $525 per hour. And, and everything is piling up. So they're coming after our youngsters now. They're not satisfied with the fathers. Now they want to go after the it's kids. A Soviet, it's a Soviet tactic, Arthur. They, they, they can't break the parents. They go after the wives, children, daughters, and sons. That's what they're doing right now. I mean, they went after my brother multiple times, and now they're coming after my boys. So uh, you can help us to survive this. I mean, Rebel News is not covering this case. Um, I have to raise the money myself. So I'm doing crowdfunding, streetchurch.ca, streetchurch.ca, and you can donate, you can help. I mean, this trial will be probably $35,000, dollars $50,000. Um, and, 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 but we have to fight. I mean, my son um, could get away with all of this. He was charged with attending illegal protests and harassment because he dared to read the Bible. And at this moment, that was his first offense. So he could just pay a fine um, and, and we can move on. But I think the case is so important for the freedom of religion and freedom of expression that we must fight. That's why I decided to hire a lawyer to, to put a stop into this insanity where a mayor can implement some stupid illegal bylaw uh, like a little tyrant that they want to be so we're fighting and if you want to be part of this if you want to help us go to streetchurch.ca and um, nathaniel is fighting we're fighting we're, we have no intention of stopping i mean uh, I, i'm not fighting anymore just for myself i'm fighting for the future of my children and your children as well and those cases are extremely important if they can get away with this i'm telling you they're going to cook something else no question. All right, we're going to end this on Rumble. Doesn't change anything from our side. Come over to Locals, vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Got a bunch of uh, questions for you that have been adding up here. So ending on uh, ending on Rumble, come over to Locals now, people. Arthur, I'm going to I'm going to share the screen here. I'm going to bring all of these up. Uh, they are here. No, they're here. Yeah, here they are. Okay, here we go. Let's start from the bottom. Current day, uh, it is done via censorship rather than punishing those who are listening to the other media. That's dull and tired. I'm not your buddy guy says the rise in the rising evil in the West is dangerous. The fight is here and now and should evil win, there will be nowhere to flee. We don't get to choose when we're when we're born, but we get to choose how we live. And then that, that was some of the, the discussions I had, uh, Arthur, with with people who fled, you know, the Eastern Bloc and they came to the protest in Ottawa. And I was like, well, so if, it, if, if the poop hits the fan in Canada, do you go back home? And they say there's nowhere to go after Canada and America fall. There's nowhere else to go. That's right. That's right. And I, say, I want to say the same thing. You're absolutely right, because this is, you know, when I was growing up, it was just a local. So it was part of Europe. It was um, it was not a global attack on our rights. Now it's global. I mean, it's everywhere, everywhere in, in a third world countries, in Europe, in Asia, you, you name it. Show me a country that was not subjected to this lie. That's why there's nowhere to run. Believe me, you got to rise up. You got to stand up peacefully, solidarity style come together and you know i want to just say one thing do not allow this divide and conquer strategies that i see everywhere now everyone it seems hates everyone and fights everyone i got no time for division i want to unite the army of uh, a free-minded people canadians that are standing in solidarity with each other for the sake of the children enough of division i don't like this guy oh he said this and uh he said that enough of this 
That's what they want. They want to divide us, segregate, separate, isolate, and pound on us because they're predators. That's what they are. All right, I'm going to bring this back up here. There's, there's more. How do I get to here? Is it over here? Here we go. Uh, Tin Stacks. Archer's message has great potential. The potential to prevent our families from dying in an incoming war. It is critical we prevent this in USA. We must unite. Nuremberg trials now entry required. There's an industry of homeless, illegal immigration, mental health, and LGBTQ plus in America, Europe. Mr. Entry required. Highlander Ultra says, God bless this, bless this man. It chills down my back. Wow, that was when we were playing the video. Entry required says, I would argue Easter is the holiest Christian holiday. We're gonna who we're not gonna argue over that. Entry required. US and Canada now is tyranny, January 6th. Freedom truckers, crap, outrageous. It's circa seven. Uh, let me see here. I'm not going to do this. I want to make sure also, Arthur, you don't get into any more trouble. By the way, by the way, Easter is Passover. <laughs> it's the same holiday. Oh, that, that's, that's, uh, yeah, I think it's cement. Yeah. Oh, because, yeah. Uh, what do we got? Cod tongues. You say they please name the names if you can. I live in Calgary and want to expose the weasels. Rewatch. Question for Arthur Pavlovsky. A question, Pastor Pawlowski, do you need to see a psychiatrist to determine if you know the difference between a boy and a girl or if you need help to trust the science? Archer, another person asked, I don't know where the, where the, where the question is now, how the hell are you holding it together? Like, I, I understand that you, you have a belief in, in, in a higher power. How do you get through 45 days in, in, in a shithole prison? Yeah, that's a good question um, because I'm no uh, stronger than, than you. And uh, here is how I, uh, I was able to, 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 to stand my ground. And I actually did shows and I spoke uh, to the people from, from prison. Um, here is what kept me sane. It was my faith, my family, and the people that I was told are standing there with me. I remember I would call my wife and I would ask her, tell me, does anyone care? Are there people contacting? Are, is there a, a, an outcry for what they're doing to me? And my wife would say, Art, don't quit. Don't give up. There is thousands, tens of thousands of people that are calling, messaging. There are protests outside of Canadian embassies all over. People are outraged. They are standing there with you. Yes, you're suffering there, but they're suffering with you. That kept me going every day. And the next day I would call my wife and I say, does anyone care? Are they covering the story? Are they talking? So that's why I'm so grateful to you. You got no idea. But when I watch you covering this, I said, there is a man that understands what's going on and he's willing to talk about what is happening to me. That's what kept me going. And I don't know, I don't know if people realize that, that we are in this together. You covering the stories, me going through the ordeal. We are in this together. Without you, no one will know. Without me, no one will know what is really going on. They would not be able to see it firsthand that there are actually human beings going through this craziness. So we are in this together and we are extremely needed. That's what kept me going. My faith in God that I know that I know that I was doing this for something bigger. Also, you know why I didn't quit? And I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I had my moments, especially when I was in a metal cage. I said, they're going to murder me here. That's it. I said goodbye to my wife and my children. I said, I'm not coming out of this alive. No man can. I mean, this is crazy stuff or freezing conditions in Edmonton. So, um, you know why I kept doing this another day? Because I realized this is no longer about Arthur Pulaski. This was no longer just about me. This fight is a lot bigger than just one man or one family. I was being there in prison for you. For the rest of the free world, I was be I became a symbol of resistance and they wanted to break me psychologically and physically. My back was so messed up that a friend of mine, a, a chiropractor, came to my home. He says, I've never seen more messed up back than yours. Concrete every day, uh, hard materials, metal cages broke my back to a point that it was all twisted. He says, look at you all twisted he showed it to my wife how twisted it was a uh, completely dislocated it, it was insane but you know i realized I, I think halfway through it i called my wife or my son i don't remember because they were messing with my phone privileges and i called i think my wife and i said you know what when when she told me again hold 
stand strong don't quit don't quit there's too many people relying on your on your stand you have become a symbol of hope for those people and i said you know i feel more and more that my story is no longer about us is no longer about the little pastor from the from the streets of calgary that this is a global symbol of resistance and i have to i have to survive this i have to hold on and stay strong and that's how i prayed i said god give me a strength for another day i don't know what they're going to cook for me tomorrow what they're going to do to me tomorrow but give me strength when they put me in a psych ward i'll tell you i look around and there were people jumping up and down or walking in a circle i just I said, God, I mean, this is too much for one man to endure. So give me a strength that I can survive this ordeal. They locked me in a cell with a schizophrenic. Remember, I was considered the most dangerous inmate in a country, a terrorist, and I could not even have a pen. They locked me for a week with this guy in Edmonton in a psych ward. Uh, he murdered his brother with a machete. And I walked in and I said, look, you've got pens and pencils. Wow, how lovely. I am not allowed to have a pen. And he says, well, you can have mine. And he gave me his pen. And I realized, I think they locked me there with this guy because they are hoping that he's going to stop me. He's going to hurt me because he could see stuff, right? And he would jump and like he sees things. Um, I think that was the tactic. So one day at a time, my fate, my family, my church and realization that I'm not just doing this anymore just for myself. I'm doing this. I'm suffering for a bigger purpose uh, for humanity. Well, I just, I mean, I say after all this, I hope it's not all for naught because uh, it's not clear where Canada is going, where the world is going, and it doesn't doesn't look good at all. Arthur, there's some questions um, in our locals community. A mighty pay says, praying for you, Arthur. Keep fighting the good fight. Godspeed. Stephen Britton says, I disagree with you on much, Arthur. However, what you what has happened to you is unforgivable. I'm praying for you. Uh, what does off... Oh, this is from Steve Britton. It says, what does off the street mean in the context you're using? I'm not being contrary. I'm genuinely asking because it usually takes a lot of time and effort for people to stabilize themselves to the point of having a home, job, food, etc. That goes back to... I think you explained what you meant by off the street in terms of... Um, yeah, so... What you do is um, feeding them is just the first step. Then you need to get them off the streets into halfway housing. Uh, it takes about six months to one year, believe it or not, for a homeless person to actually start thinking clearly. Um, so the people are so messed up on the streets is, is unbelievable. And then you look for job and, and that's where they can afford to have their own apartment. And so it, it's a process. It takes a lot of work and efforts and it's not an easy thing. Uh, to do to get the people that is hooked on all kinds of drugs off the streets. All right. Now I have scrolled down to the bottom. I'm going to go back up now. N. Spence says, God working through you, Arthur, and his mercy never fails. From your mouth, I was going to make it from your mouth to God's ears, N. Spence. Entry required says, Viva, are you going to ask the pastor our rumble rants, right? You said that was 100% to you. That's yes. And I'm also going to help. I'm going to contribute to Arthur's cause as well. There's no question about that. Dread Robert, interview with a man on house arrest. He has a minute for a longer interview, Viva. Some humor in this, at least. Um, and then Dread Robert yeah, says, Arthur let, is... Let, let's just stop here for a second. You know, if I was them, if I was the villains, I'll never lock a man like me in a house arrest. I mean, are you crazy? <laughs> this is... I, well... You you this are is, allowed giving interviews, Arthur, right? Yeah. You no, know, well, I said to my lawyers, I said, if there is any gag order, if there is any any attempt to silence me leave me in prison i i'm not i don't want to go out leave me there i'm fine i'll be doing interviews through the phone from my uh, from my uh, uh, unit um so they knew because they were listening to my conversations with the lawyers believe it or not my conversations with the lawyer that's supposed to be privileged right uh, no one could listen they would leave the doors open we had to talk on a phone and the guard was listening and taking notes in Canada with my, you know, uh, conversation with my legal representative is is crazy. It, it, I think it's they're giving you the January six treatment. It's like it's like America and Canada either never had the limits or they just learned the same lessons at the same time, like infiltrating yeah. solicitor client privilege discussions. It's 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 crazy. It's, it's crazy. crazy. My, lawyer, 
my lawyer is going to be testifying because I'm I have an intention of going after those villains. Uh, but you know, if I was them, I would never lock a guy like me in front of a TV because now I can talk for the whole day, um, multiple times. Sometimes I'm doing ten shows a day, and uh, and you know that's why I got tired and I said that said I, I need a break. Um, you know what I would do? I would just unleash the guy to do what he was doing, which is I'm so busy with feeding the homeless. I'm so busy with being a pastor, visiting people in hospitals and counseling. I'm busy within the capacity of my work, but because you locked me up, now I have no other option than to just to keep talking about the corruption. It's Arthur, it's it's the Streisand effect hits politics. I mean, like it, it gives you more time to talk and it raises your awareness to other people and it just gets amplified and amplified and amplified. And it should it should be the downfall. Uh, you know, at the, on the one hand, there's provincial abuse and then there's federal abuse. It should be the downfall of these regimes and, and the end of their legacy or the beginning of the stain that they've left on our country. And then a Dred, Dred Robert says, Arthur is dangerous, actually trying to speak truth against power. Uh, Steve Britton says, I was in Milk River. It was wonderful. Dred Robert says, good to know this predates Trudeau. Not a rotten apple, but a rotten barrel in Canada. Um, and then we got Steve Britton says, do you have any statistics on how many people you've taken off the streets who end up back on the streets? Again, not being a contrarian, just asking questions. Um, Arthur, I'm glad we finally did this. Holy crab apples. This is an actual marathon. And I, th I think some most people could have run a marathon in this time. Um, all right, so you are, you are, you're doing okay. I mean, you look like you're doing okay. All, all things considered, you know, how, how was the theater of Mrs. Lincoln, but you look like you're doing okay. You got a kid with head on his shoulders. Like it's nobody's business. I, you know, the, I, I, when I interviewed him, it, it, it's amazing. You, you've done a, an amazing job with him. He's an amazing, strong kid. You are, you don't need to be told. I don't think, you know, you're at a point where you don't have the choice. You're thrust in the position that you're in, but you're giving hope to people and you're also revealing the insanity of Canada and you are the catalyst that's bringing it to the awareness of the eyes of Americans and hopefully something changes. Um, okay. So you'll give me, you will give me an update. We'll, we'll say our proper goodbyes after this, but you'll give us an update and come back on. I mean, we'll see what happens after your sentencing in the interim between now and September 18, you are, you're sitting in your beautiful office and you're, you're, uh, you're telling your story. Yes, I have been doing that. I mean, I can still leave my house uh, when I have a special permission. And um, so far, so good. When I ask, I cannot leave the country. I was offered, of course, to do another tour in the States. I was um, asked to come and testify uh, before the European Parliament. I was asked to testify before the, the Polish Parliament. Um, but I'm not allowed to leave the country. So I'll see what the judge says on uh, September 18th. I promise you this. I keep telling the truth. I'll keep not taking the bribes because I'm not for sale and I will not allow them to scare me. I'll do what I do as a pastor, as a shepherd of God's people. I must defend them from the wolves. And I'm telling you, there's a lots of wolves uh, around. And um, immediately after the sentencing, we can't wait. Actually, I talked to my lawyer a few days ago and she says, like, I can't wait for the sentencing so I can file the appeal. Mm -hmm. The appeal is already drafted. We're going after them. And um, so the fight will continue. The fight will continue. This is not over. And then I am looking actively for a lawyer that can represent us. I'm going after them for what they have done with Adam Germain, John Rook, uh, Bill Gates, uh, not Bill Gates, David Gates of Alberta um, and, and all those, um, uh, you know, uh, political activists, because they're no, they're no longer judges. Um, I want to go after them. I mean, this is not going to end just because a judge will say whatever he is going to say. I will keep fighting. Amazing, Arthur. You're uh, not just welcome back on. I'll, I'll insist. I'll insist. I'm joking, but you'll come back on. We'll talk. Uh, we'll see what the sentencing is. We'll see what happens between now and then, and the appeal. I mean, I, I presume. Do you know offhand the grounds of appeal? Are you challenging the constitutionality of these measures in the first place? Void for vagueness, uh, evidentiary stuff? Do you, oh, no, never mind. Sorry. Scratch that question. Do not answer that question. We'll see your appeal when it comes out. Yeah, there um, is a lot. There is a lot to it. There is a lot to it. Yeah, and, and I should, I should, well, I should, whether or not I should have asked that question, I will, you will not answer it. It's a revealing strategy. Arthur, I cannot thank you enough, but I'm going to try. Uh, stick around. We'll say our proper goodbyes afterwards. Everyone in locals who's watching now, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to snip and clip. I mean, this, this, there's, there's segments of this 
that need to echo through the ages and need to be memorialized on the internet for everyone to see. Thank you for telling your story. Thank you so much for having me. Again, I am um, from the bottom of my heart and my friends and my family members, I thank you for willing to talk about what is happening to us. And, and you've done that from the very beginning. So thank you. All right. We'll talk. We're we'll sticking around. Everyone else, enjoy the rest of the day. Peace out.